Then housing will please come to order. <coughs> At today's hearing, the subcommittee, in a sense, goes back to the future to examine events that occurred in 1985 relating to moderate rehabilitation programs and the coinsurance program of the Department of Housing and Urban Development. We will be hearing testimony from two former Federal Housing Commissioners, Ms. Shirley Wiseman, Ms. Janet Hale, about how a highly questionable project in Durham, North Carolina, one that involved subsidy upon subsidy upon subsidy, came to be approved by HUD. We will focus on the decision-making process at HUD. As a result of HUD's approval of this project, the developers received more than $11 million in rent subsidies, more than $2 million in urban development action grants, and more than $3 million in tax credits for a total of $16 million in tax expenditures. We will also be examining why the cautionary flag raised by the HUD Inspector General in 1985 about potential problems in the coinsurance program, which are costing so much to the American taxpayer, were ignored by key HUD officials. Since uh, these hearings began in early May, we have heard testimony from almost two dozen individuals. In carefully reviewing all of the testimony, it appears that some of the testimony strains believability. Some of it has subsequently been repudiated by the witness giving it. And some statements may well border on perjury. On May 25, Secretary Pierce testified before this subcommittee under oath that he did not direct funding decisions on projects, that this function was delegated to others. The testimony we will hear today about Mr. Pierce's role in directing that funding for the Durham project be approved raises very serious conflicts with Mr. Pierce's prior statement. Mr. Fred Bush, a former deputy staff director to the then vice president, former presidential campaign fundraiser, and a partner in a consulting firm that touted its ability to push the right buttons, contended before the subcommittee that he had no political influence. That is about as believable as Elvis being seen in a Kmart store. <laughs> Paul Manafort testified that before his group formally met with the New Jersey Public Housing Authority, to urge that public housing authority to apply to HUD for rent subsidies for their project in Upper Deerfield, New Jersey. One of his partners had earlier met with the public housing authority officials who reviewed the project and found it to be meritorious. Recently, we received a lengthy, quote, letter of clarification, end quote, from Mr. Manafort, stating that no such earlier meeting had taken place but rather Mr. Manafort's partner himself had found his own project to be meritorious. Our next hearing will take place on Monday, July 17, when our witnesses will be Ambassador Carla Hills, Mr. John Allen, developer for the Durham, North Carolina project, Mr. Hunter Cushing, former Deputy Assistant Secretary for Multi-Family Housing Programs. Before uh, calling today's panel, the Chair would like to make a few observations. The Chair would like to state with all the emphasis at his command that being called as a witness before this subcommittee, appearance before this subcommittee, in itself implies no wrongdoing whatsoever. The fact that an individual is invited either means that he or she is a material witness to the subject of the subcommittee's investigation, or that he or she has something of value to contribute. A few days ago, the subcommittee had 
uh, the pleasure of hearing our new secretary of HUD, Jack Kemp. And uh, within a couple of weeks, it will be our pleasure to have as our witness uh, former Senator Proxmire, chairman of the Housing uh, uh, Committee in the Senate for many years, who will contribute his enormous knowledge to um, HUD and its operations. Secondly, to uh, deal with an issue which has received some uh, attention, Chair would like to state for the record that uh, the granting of immunity to any witness uh, is not under active consideration by this subcommittee. Third, the Chair would like to reiterate the statement that uh, I and others have made on many occasions that we will be extremely vigilant in guaranteeing that the hot fiasco is not used for eliminating necessary and useful programs on which millions of Americans depend for their housing needs. In this connection, uh, let me state also that HUD, contrary to some impressions, is not just an agency that deals with uh, providing housing for the very poor, but for vast numbers of middle-class American families and individuals. Let me finally uh, state that uh, Congressman Shays and uh, I introduced legislation, H.R. 2850, which attempts to recapture something like $391 million um, of taxpayer funds by facilitating the refinancing of hot subsidized mortgages. A number of my colleagues are already co-sponsors and I invite all members of the subcommittee and indeed all of my colleagues in the House to co-sponsor this legislation. This is our first legislative attempt to try to recapture some of the vast sums that have been lost through mismanagement and other reasons. I'd like to invite the two individuals who are today's witnesses to come up to the witness table. We have Ms. Shirley Wiseman, former, former General Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Department of Housing and Urban Development, and Ms. Janet Hale, also former General Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Department of Housing and Urban Development, Please take your seats. Um, when Ms. Hale arrives, we will be um, swearing her in. Please. Wonder if I might ask you both to stand. You solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Please be seated. I'd like to call, of course, uh, before we hear from you on my colleagues, Congressman Lukens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as one of the um, enthusiastic co-sponsors of the capturing bill, I'm pleased to be a member of the subcommittee. I want to say that under your strong leadership, the work of the subcommittee and these oversight hearings are playing an essential role in guaranteeing HUD housing programs to eventually ensure an adequate supply of affordable housing for both poor and middle class Americans, and hopefully an end to fraud, waste, and mismanagement in supplying that housing. Although we dwelt thus far in the 80s, the phrase two decades of decay really sums up the abuses which have occurred in HUD in past administrations. While the MHR program has an admirable goal of providing low rent housing, it's been designed basically and used certainly to reward political supporters and taken advantage of by many consultants to gain lucrative consulting contracts. The June 24, 1980 Boston Herald reported the following on HUD programs of the 70s. It's like a lottery where few strike it big, quoted from a GAO draft report. Following up those decades of decay at HUD, the Boston Herald further reported on June 25, 80, that Section 8 housing programs have been ripe for fraud and abuse. But we've had plenty of warning. Instead of providing rental subsidies for low and moderate housing uh, families it was intended to do, the plan has become a costly program which has been mismanaged had given developers cash to burn and provided few checks on how they burn it. Now at last, we can look forward to an effective and clean, quote, quote, HUD. 
Earlier this week, Secretary Kemp strongly affirmed his goal before this committee, and this committee strongly endorsed that HUD programs will benefit directly those programs Congress in, was and is intending to help. His efforts to remove costly consultants from the process is very commendable and a giant step toward correcting and improving HUD's programs, which have decayed for these decades. Thank you. Thank you very much. Congressman Frank. Mr. Chairman, I must express some <clears throat> disagreement with the ranking member's uh, general statement. I think the, by, by using the phrase two decades of uh, mismanagement, apparently he thinks we should be criticizing uh, also the, the Nixon and Ford and uh, Carter administrations as well as the Reagan administration. I think it is a mistake to give the impression, as I think his statement gave, I don't know if it was intended, it may not have been, that uh, what we had and what we are uncovering now is just business as usual. In every government program, there is a tension between the people trying to run that program well and the people who, for various other motives, personal gain or something else, are trying to pull it off center. And obviously that has happened in previous administrations, Nixon, Ford, and Carter, covered in his uh, two decades. But it's a great mistake to condemn all of those people by saying that during their administrations, things were the same. We will have a former HUD secretary testifying before us, Carla Hills. She was HUD secretary during the gentleman's two decades. I suspect that Ms. Hills will vigorously disagree with any suggestion that HUD under her tenure was run the same as it was during the previous eight years, and I will be one who will agree with her. I don't think we ought to ever fall into the trap, whether we're talking about crimes of violence or cheating on your income tax or fraud in government programs, of even indirectly giving credence to the argument that everybody does it. Everybody doesn't do it, and people do it at different levels. And I just want to assert, in fairness to the previous administrations, two of which were Republican and one of which was Democratic, the degree of pathology we saw in HUD during the previous eight years differs, in my judgment, from the 12 years prior to that. Yes, there are always problems, but I do not believe that we have ever seen abuse and fraud and a disregard of the fundamental programmatic mission of an agency prior to that in either administration of either party, as we have seen in these past eight years and the material that's come out in this, uh, in this set of hearings. Chairman, may I make a very brief statement? I, thank you very much, Congressman Kyle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I hadn't intended to, but in view of uh, Mr. Lucan and, uh, and Mr. Frank's comments, uh, uh, let me just make a brief statement. I thoroughly agree with Mr. Frank that uh, when Carla Hills testifies, I think we're going to, to see the example of the kind of administrator of the agency that we would all like to see in that position. And uh, I have no doubt that during her administration, the, uh, the programs were run uh, exceedingly well. I think the point Mr. Lukens was trying to make is one that's somewhat sensitive to those of us on this side of the, uh, of the dais, and that is that there's been a great deal of, uh, of comment about the Reagan administration, but as Mr. Lukens was inferring, if not stating, particularly in the state of Massachusetts, where there have been a series of news reports uh, in the 79-80 um, uh, period, the HUD program was used for purely political purposes and related to the other party. Gentlemen, you Certainly, I'd be happy to yield, my friend. Any suggestion, if that's what it's intended, that what went on in 1979 and 80 is at all comparable in scope to the kind of disgrace we have seen now seems to me wholly inaccurate. And if members want to bring forward specific information, I'd be glad to look at it. Mr. Lucas has quoted one newspaper column a couple of times. Uh, I do not believe that we have seen during any part of his two decades anything like this. The notion that, yeah, there was some political influence, there always is in various government programs. But no one has brought forward facts, and if people want to, I'm sure this chairman, being as fair as he is, would be glad to call people. If you've got evidence of that, we ought to bring it forward. But I reject any suggestion that what went on in 79 and 80 is comparable to the kind of things we saw with, uh, with Jim Watt and with uh, Paul Manafort. Again, Mr. Chairman, reclaiming my time, I think uh, Mr. Frank here is, is at least half right, and that is that it was a different kind of abuse. Uh, in the case of Massachusetts, and I, I think uh, that, that the gentleman is correct, we probably ought to identify the other kinds of abuses to which these programs uh, uh, are subject. The kind of abuse that was reported extensively in the media, uh, or in the newspapers, I should say, relating to the uh, Massachusetts situation uh, was that for purely political reasons, 
That is to say, if you will contribute to the Carter presidential campaign, we will give you a HUD housing project. The program was abused. Now, if that is true, that is a... Is there evidence of that? Uh, I have heard that allegation several times and not seen a shred of evidence except references to one newspaper column. Well, I have seen several newspaper columns and I think perhaps this is something we ought to get into Where, because it does... Well, I don't have them with me, Mr. No, Frank, but I have been talking about it for several them. months and you never have it with you. I, I had it with me at the last hearing, Mr. Frank, and if you would like to get into it, I would be delighted to get into it. I don't think that's what we want to do right here at the moment, but I do think it is a fair statement that under both Democratic and Republican administrations there have been problems, albeit problems of different kinds, but I would suggest that trading uh, projects for political contributions is at least as outrageous an abuse of the system as is so-called influence peddling. And I think we ought to get into it all. The general would agree, I would agree, but we're getting the same repeated allegations and no evidence. I didn't yield him. Mr. Chairman, I think it probably, in, in view of Mr. Frank's comments, would be appropriate to bring forth the uh, media reports of the time and perhaps we could interview some witnesses and call them to uh, get into that matter. I'd be happy to yield to my friend from Ohio. It, yes, on my thanks to gentleman for yielding. First of all, I didn't mean to set off a firestorm and certainly purposely did not mention any specific individuals. Um, I, I think the issue, and the chairman and I have discussed it very briefly at one time, can be joined at a later time. I don't wish to dilute the importance of today's meeting in any way, shape, or form. I don't mean to make it uh, an overall tent, Mr. Frank, of, of involvement. I'm just saying that there are provable and demonstrable instances of abuse of HUD almost since its inception, regrettably. And I'm here really to try and solve a problem rather than create new ones. I just would like to say to the gentleman, and certainly to the chairman and members of the committee, I wanted to raise the point in a frame of two decades of mismanagement without any, any particular individuals because there's adequate uh, evidence. Now that you raised it, we'd be happy to support these contentions with a lot of evidence. Okay, thank you, thank I, you gentlemen. I, I want to thank um, all of my colleagues for their interventions and for calling on my friend from California. Although it is unseemly to quote oneself, the chair would like to remind uh, his friends on both sides of the aisle that um, virtue is not the monopoly of either political party. Uh, American history is ample evidence of that. There are excellent people in the Republican Party. There are excellent people in the Democratic Party. We have, has, uh, we have had outstanding public servants from both political parties in office. And, uh, and I, I want to thank all of my colleagues for their, for their dialogue. <laughs> Congressman Martinez. Mr. Chairman, in lieu of the fact that we've already had a heady debate <laughs> <laughs> on matters of another era, I think, and uh, as one of my colleagues has stated, not to diffuse the moment, because too many times that sometimes is a ploy to diffuse the moment by bringing up past history, which is really not re relevant. I would rather... Uh, or go any statement to hear from the witness. Thank you very much. Congressman Shays. Congressman Schumer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, again, thank you for uh, your graciousness and leadership. Uh, I think today's hearings uh, are important, and we should get to the substance of those hearings. I think there are two levels of importance as we move along. First, the HUD scandal grows and grows and grows as the, uh, I'm the chairman of the task force on the Budget Committee on Urgent Fiscal Issues, and we've been trying to keep tabs monetarily of how much HUD has lost. At the beginning of the week, we came to the conclusion that they had lost about $2 billion due to these kinds of problems. And Secretary Kemp, at our last hearing, Mr. Chairman, said that number was in ballpark correct. Well. When you do the estimate on Friday rather than Tuesday, the number goes up by half a billion dollars. The coinsurance program, at least as the Price Waterhouse uh, uh, survey indicates, uh, costs another $350 million. The loan management program, another $80 million. And the FHA loan guarantee, another $125 million. So the bottom line on cost is now it looks like a minimum of $2.5 billion and there's no end in sight. The numbers keep going up and up and up as we uncover more and more mismanagement and waste at HUD. The second thing about these hearings is the focus really begins on Samuel Pierce. In fact, the factual news seems to be tightening around Secretary Pierce's neck. 
because he has simply said throughout his eight years at uh, HUD, he didn't know anything, he wasn't involved, etc. More and more witnesses point to the fact that he seemed to know a lot more than he lets on to. And today's witnesses will tell us uh, about some of that. We all know that to where today's hearing is leading. It's leading to two simple questions. And that is, what did Secretary Pierce know and when did he know it? And I hope the committee will continue to pursue these lines as you have been so avidly so we can get to the bottom of this. Thank you, Mr. Thank you very much. Let me just make an observation about estimating the cost of the fiasco. Uh, the chair finds this exercise to be relatively unproductive as we go along day after day after day because the picture changes. I think we have clearly established the fact that this is a multi-billion dollar fiasco. It is our hope that uh, with uh, the legislation that uh, Congressman Shays and I introduced uh, with uh, Secretary Kemp's Asset Recovery Task Force, which will attempt to recapture as much of the lost funds as possible, uh, we will reduce the amount. But I think it's extremely important to bear in mind that uh, we are dealing with very large sums of money. And whether it's $2 billion, $3 billion, or as some media, some uh, um, uh, magazines and other uh, media outlets have estimated it may run as high as seven or eight billion, is at this stage premature to, to uh, speculate on. None of us at this stage have hard figures. We are estimating the work of this subcommittee will reach well into the fall other committees of the Senate and the House are beginning their investigations just now. We welcome their investigation because our staff surely is not large enough uh, to reach into every corner of the hot fiasco. Uh, it is my hope, and I'm sure all of my colleagues share the hope, that the final figure will be less than what we are anticipating. Uh, but at this moment, it seems we are dealing with a multi-billion dollar uh, financial crisis. Mr. Chairman, Congressman yeah, I Schumer. must say, and I estimating these numbers, we have to take a snapshot on August 15th. We have to have some awareness of at least the best estimates we can. These estimates are rather conservative. Some work has gone into them, and I have to say I think they're necessary. We will first hear from uh, Ms. Shirley Wiseman, who served as General Deputy Assistant Secretary and Acting Housing Commissioner um, in the Department of Housing and Urban Development and is presently President of the National Association of Home Builders. Um, Ms. Wiseman, of course, is appearing voluntarily and we are very appreciative of her appearance. Ms. Wiseman, I would like to ask you to uh, uh, submit whatever written statement you have, and it will be entered into the record in its entirety. You may proceed in any way you choose. I believe it will be very helpful if you will make some reference to your long experience in the field of housing and your experience as a housing expert, uh, and then discuss perhaps your involvement and work with HUD, and then talk about whatever present activities you may choose to do. So we are delighted to have you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Would you be so kind and pull the mic very close to you? <clears throat> Thank you. I, I do appreciate this opportunity. I would like to clarify the fact that I am Shirley McVeigh Wiseman. I'm a home builder and developer from Lexington, Kentucky, in Orlando, Florida. And I'm appearing in that capacity today alone. I appreciate that. I, I am a housing development expert with 25 years experience in building and development. I've built over 1,500 homes, developed lands and commercial properties. I'm an appraiser with a senior master appraiser designation. I've been a realtor for over 20 years. From 1983 to 1980. Could you pull it a bit closer? Pull it down a little bit too, and then I think we'll, we'll be able okay. to hear you. Nobody usually has trouble hearing me. From 1983 to 1985, I was employed by the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Initially, I served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Single Family Housing, 
and later was appointed the General Deputy Assistant Secretary for Housing. From approximately December or early January of 1984 or January of 85 to May of 85, I was the Acting Assistant Secretary, Federal Housing Commissioner. The Durham Hosiery Mill project, which the committee has asked me to testify on today, was referred to me for funding consideration under the Section 8 Mod Rehab program while I was serving in the latter position from January to May of 85. There were a number of unusual circumstances, complexities, and waivers surrounding this project. The details I don't completely remember. But as a consequence, I ask that the project be reviewed carefully by the professional career staff. It was the staff's recommendation that the project not be funded, and based on their findings, I didn't approve the project for funding. I'll be happy to. That's the extent of my prepared statement. I'll be happy to answer anything that, that uh, you might care to ask me. Let me just say, as a home builder and developer, that I am a great supporter of affordable housing. I would urge this committee to support programs in light of the tremendous cut that the housing industry has taken to, to support programs that can continue to provide safe and decent affordable housing for this country. Thank you very much, Ms. Wiseman, for your opening uh, observations. We will want to ask you about a number of topics, but uh, since you began with the Durham Hosiery Mill project, uh, before we get into that, I would like to uh, support your initial statement um, that um, you asked uh, your professional staff to review this project. Uh, and it was the staff's recommendation that the project not be funded. And on the basis of their findings, you did not approve the funding for the project. That's correct. You are, uh, you are uh, absolutely correct. And I would like to uh, place into the record a number of statements, some of them preceding your work at HUD and some of them taking place after you left HUD, that all support your basic position. These are statements in writing by HUD career employees regarding the Durham Hosiery Mill project. Uh, February 8, 1982, quote, this location would place elderly tenants in an unsafe neighborhood environment. The structure is physically and functionally obsolete. Cost to convert to housing use would greatly exceed new construction." End quote. February 16, 1982. There is an active railroad 40 feet from the building. There is heavy commercial traffic. It is an unsafe, deteriorated neighborhood. I cannot recommend accepting this proposal in this place at this time. It is, in fact, not reasonable if we are cognizant of waste and abuse in government." End quote. February 22, 1982. There are over 150-gallon drums containing potentially hazardous waste that, are stored at the, that were stored at the hosiery mill. When analysis revealed that some drums contain sulfuric acid and cyanide, a HUD official wrote, this combination of chemicals is the same used in the death chamber. This combination of chemicals is the same used in the death chamber in the North Carolina Central Prison. End quote. September 24, 1984. Quote. The hosiery mill project has been a source of ill feeling in the field regarding the undue pressure applied by central office of FHA during the UDAG, that's one of the grants, review period, including, for example, a directive by central office that the area office of FHA staff specifically not put anything in the FHA commitment regarding an environmental problem with the site. 
is a remarkable observation. Central office directing the field office not to say anything about environmental problems. September 24, 1985. With all due respect, this is a bad project. It is chock full of policy waivers and multiple subsidies. It is a project, furthermore, that will place low-income elderly on a site characterized by excess noise levels and arguably a site that still contains certain levels of toxic chemicals. September 24, 1985. This is truly a prophetic statement. Quote, the durham hosiery Mill project is, in my opinion, is a potential source of embarrassment for the department. February 9, 1987. Valuation section recommends rejection of this project due to the high cost of rehab exceeds the cost of new building, obsolescence, and excessive expense of operations. So your judgment that you did not want to fund this project is supported by, and this is, these are only selected statements, by a long list of professional staff recommendations supporting your decision. And these staff recommendations precede your service with HUD and take place after your service with HUD. Now, explain, please, to the subcommittee, uh, Ms. Wiseman, uh, what contact did you have with Ms. Deborah Dean concerning this project? The project uh, portfolio was sent to my office uh, for review, and I was contacted by Deborah to review it and uh, to send it forward. What does it mean, send it forward? That means to approve it? Yes. Um, were, you, were you contacted by Miss Dean in writing, by telephone, or in person? No, sir. I was always contacted by telephone concerning this project. To the best of your recollection, I realize this was several years ago, G give us the nature of the, of the, of the conversation. What did Miss Dean tell you on the phone? Uh, she asked me if the project had been forwarded to my office, and I said yes. And she asked me if I had reviewed it, and I answered that I had not uh, reviewed it in depth, but I would review it, and I would send it uh, to the professional staff for their uh, further review. I, uh, I did at a later date, two or three days, or perhaps even a week, uh, look through the project, it appeared, and I was not that uh, familiar with it, but it appeared that, that the same problems were still there. And so I sent it downstairs to the multifamily office for uh, further review. At that time, uh, it took perhaps a week, maybe a little longer. And we had several, I had several conversations with different people on the multifamily staff that there were still problems that had not been corrected since the initial application. There were subsidy on subsidy. There were waivers that would be required. There were excessive costs that made the project, in their opinion, uh, prohibitive. And they would recommend to me uh, that I not fund the project. It was uh, subsequently sent to my office uh, with the recommendation that it not be funded. Uh, I put it in a box behind my desk and it sort of sat there. Um, at a future time, perhaps two or three days later, uh, Deborah called me again and asked me if uh, I had finished the review and if the staff had finished the review, which I answered yes. And uh, she said, well, are you sending it forward? or something to that effect. And I said, no, Deborah, I cannot fund the project. It has too many problems. I have gone over it with the professional staff, and they absolutely recommend that it not be funded, and I can't fund it. What was her response? Uh, just that she thought I should fund it, that I knew the secretary wanted it funded. Um, that Ms. was basic. Miss Deborah Dean told you that Secretary Pierce wanted the project funded. Yes, sir. 
What was your response after that? I said, I'm sorry, I can't find it. Uh, what happened after that? I guess I again delayed because I put the packet behind my desk on a uh, table and, and left it there. The, the files you didn't feel like dealing with, you put the behind. Yes, sort of. <laughs> Yeah, there's a no. lot of symbolism in that, but uh, let's let's move on. We, uh, it, if if we didn't want to deal with it that at that moment, we put it behind on the, okay. the credenza. Okay. But I left it there. I do. For, that too. I I I'm not sure. I can't tell you. It was two, three days, as much as four or five days, and I received a call from the secretary asking me. From for Secretary Pierce. Yes, sir. May I ask? how frequently you got calls from Secretary Pierce concerning specific project funding? I, I, I don't ever remember him calling me specifically about any funding before. Is it your test? He called me before. Yes, but not about specific projects that Being he funded. wanted funded. No, sir. Is it your testimony, Ms. Wiseman, that this is the only time in your service with HUD that you received a telephone call directly from the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development with respect to his desire to have a program fund, a project funded. For specific funding, it's the best of my recollection. He never called me before about funding anything. How about after this? No, sir. So this was the only time? This is the only time I ever recollect the Secretary calling and telling me to fund something, and I think I would remember that. I, I would think you would. Now, can you, to the best of your recollection, tell us what exactly Secretary Pierce told you? Yes, sir. It was a very short conversation. He uh, asked me if I had uh, received the Durham packet and had Deborah spoken with me. And uh, I said, yes, I had received it, and yes, Deborah had spoken with me. And he said, the Secretary said, uh, I want the project funded, and uh, those were his exact words, as you recall. I want that project funded, or words to that effect. I, I believe that's the exact words. I, I you that's know, close it could enough. Be, close but enough. he said, "I want the project funded," and I said, "I can't fund it, Mr. Secretary." Uh, and he said, "Well, I want it funded," and I said, "Well, I'm sorry, I can't fund it." but I will send it upstairs to you. And, and that you was did? The, yes, sir. And, and that was the end of the conversation. And you did? Yes, sir. OK. Uh, Congressman Lukens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think the Chairman has basically covered uh, the major points. I have a couple of things I'd like to clear up. I, I see in a couple of articles the word used extraordinary. Could you tell me, was there anything in your mind besides the personal phone call from Mr. Pierce that was extraordinary about this project? So well, extraordinary steps to, to, you know, to fund it. What would be normal as opposed to what was so extraordinary? Was it, I don't know how to give a rating of 1 to 10, but this is the only time the Secretary's ever called you. Has anyone else? No, he, has, he called regarding me. Regarding a yes, project. Sir. Yes, sir. Regarding funding a project. All right. So could you tell me what, what is so extraordinary, the phone call itself? The Which is certainly unusual. Well, actually, I, I, I think the most unusual thing is that the project had been around so long and was so violently opposed by the professional staff was the really unusual thing, that it, was, uh, it required uh, separate subsidies. Uh, it would have required mod rehab and either HODAG or UDAG, and there would have to be waivers. And the cost appeared to be exorbitant in, in the opinion of the professional staff. And uh, I think to, that was the most unusual thing, sir. In addition, in addition as the chairman pointed out, to the um, public health hazard in the toxic chemicals, uh, that, that's very unusual. Uh, uh, that I don't personally recollect. I, I think I was probably uh, more conscious of the fact that it was uh, several subsidies and that there were several waivers that were required that I was uh, unwilling to sign. Another uh, former HUD official, Maurice Barksdale, 
Do you remember what title we had? Or yes, sir. Maurice was the Assistant Secretary for Housing when I was the General Deputy Assistant Secretary and for Housing. He is housing. Uh, on public record also the podium this project. said he did stay around, quote, I wouldn't do the deal when I was there. It kept coming up over and over again. It was not a deal that made sense. So it simply was not a good business deal. No, sir, it was not. Okay. In its present form, it was not. I'm sorry? In, in the present form that it was in when it came to me, it was a... a person that, at least with my experience, would say it was a bad business deal. And again and again, at least in newspaper accounts, uh, the gentleman's uh, name keeps popping up as um, Charles Markham as a law partner or an associate or, or a lawyer in a law firm with which Mr. Pierce was uh, also a partner. Are you aware of that, uh, that that is a fact? No, sir, I'm not. You don't know Mr. Markham? I, I I don't think I ever met the man, no. Well, apparently, he had um, a vested interest in this, and of course, uh, obviously, was a close friend of the secretaries, and said they worked together for nearly three decades in New York City, and for some time, at least, in the same law firm. I mean, whether, whether or not that makes them law partners, technically, I'd have to refer to my legal comrades, but uh, I'm, you know of no interest, personally, that Mr. I, Markham ever displayed in this project? I don't think I ever met the man, and I, I don't know him, so I, I couldn't speak to that, sir. All right, thank well, you very much. And I would like, well, before I sign off, to commend you on your uh, appropriate and courageous action in the face of great pressure. I, think what, I wish that more people had done what you did. Thank you. Thank you very much. Congressman Martinez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just have a couple of questions. Um, when uh, Mr. Pierce called you, but if anybody terms that extraordinary or not, I think there's certainly an implication that now the top is going, is stepping in and saying, I want this project funded. For what reasons that we have to uncover and discover since the project was so bad? But when you told him you couldn't, he insisted, and when he insisted, you told him you'd send the project up to him. It seems like then you're saying, uh, I'm not going to do it, but if you want to do it, you do it, you're the secretary. Is that more but I think, sir, that that's the chain of command. Uh, if, if a subordinate doesn't do it, the only alternative is to send it far, forward without uh, signature or concurrence. Okay. Now, do you know who finally did approve, who actually? No, sir, I don't know. I have never seen the documentation after I left the department. You don't know if it was one or the other? Uh... I've heard many rumors, but I really do not personally know. Uh, why, why did you were only there a short time? It seems to me you were very effective while you were there, at least doing the job conscientiously. Why did you leave? Uh, any particular reason? Yes, I uh, have had a dream all my life. I've been a home builder for 25 years, and I wanted to run for office so that I could be the president of the National Association of Home Builders. I resigned and immediately waged a political campaign to become uh, uh, the first vice president. Uh, Vice President, Secretary, Treasurer, First Vice President, and ultimately the President of the National Association. Of well, we want Congrats. to congratulate you for having attained that. that goal. Thank you. Congratulations Thank to you. the association. They've got a good president. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Congressman Martinez. If I may uh, make a modest suggestion to my colleagues, since there are several topics that uh, Ms. Wiseman will be testifying on, it might be useful if the first round we will deal with this project and then with all of the others. Congressman yes. Kyle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have one question, and it relates to the specific kinds of um, HUD programs that were involved in this project. You mentioned several of them, and I'd just like to understand exactly what they were, uh, to the best of your recollection. One of them was an urban development grant, according to the newspaper account, of no, $2.3 million. Now, is that a UDAG grant? I, I'm not really sure what was ultimately put on the project, sir. I, at the time, uh, to the best of my recollection, it was either trying to be worked with a UDAG grant, with a HODAG grant, which was a housing development grant, and mod rehab. I don't know what it was ultimately funded with. All right. It, it, from the newspaper accounts, as I read it, it appears to include this urban development grant whichever program it was under, rent subsidy, which would be the Section 8 uh, mod uh, program, mod rehab, and the federally backed insurance, that's commonly referred to as the co-insurance program. I, I don't correct? think it was, no, it was not co-insurance, to the uh, best of my ability. 
but it was not at that time. What other federally backed insurance program is there? The, uh, there's many federally backed programs. I'm not sure what was used on the project. There were several alternatives, UDAG and HODAG, along with Mod Rehab to make it work at the particular time that I looked at it. And ultimately, I don't, I don't know what, what else was put on. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Congressman Shays. Ms. Weissman, your testimony is very frankly devastating uh, if uh, in fact it's true uh, because we have the secretary who made it very clear to us and he was asked on more than one occasion, uh, did you ever try to influence a, uh, a decision in your department for a particular project? He said no. And uh, we asked him because it seemed hard to believe, but he was so certain that he never had. So it kind of takes the breath away a bit. I'd like to ask you about something that the Secretary said in, uh, in his statements to us. And I'd like to read you the statement. And then I'd like to read you something Deborah Gordine said uh, in uh, an investigation with the IG and, and when they interviewed her. When the secretary came to us, he said, with the fair share requirements no longer applicable, it meant that the assistant secretary for housing would have sole responsibility for finally deciding who would receive funding under the MRP. It was recommended to me that as this was a very difficult and sensitive task, Perhaps it would be better for a panel or committee to have this responsibility than an individual. I agreed and decided this group should consist of the Assistant Secretary for Housing, the Under Secretary, and the Executive Assistant to the Secretary. Sometime later, I changed the composition of the selection panel to include the Under Secretary, General Counsel, and Assistant Secretary for Housing. In short, I substituted the General Counsel for the Executive Assistant to the Secretary. That's after Deborah Gordian left. Now, Deborah Gordine was, was interviewed on May 10th, 1988, and this is in the IG's report. Uh, and she said, in addition to her, the other individual positions designated for participation on the committee were the Undersecretary of HUD and the Assistant Secretary for Housing. Now, this is Deborah Gordine. There was no specific schedule for the committee to meet, so essentially the committee met on sort of an ad hoc basis whenever there were mod rehab units to be awarded. When some of the committee meetings were held, the designated committee members were not always available to participate. Consequently, a number of other HUD staff members were called upon to, to fill in the committee. She can recall the following individuals having served in the mod rehab selection committee. Janet Hale, General Deputy Assistant Secretary for Housing, Sylvia De Bartolomez, General Deputy Assistant Secretary for Housing, John Knapp, General Counsel, and Shirley Wiseman, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Single Family. My first question is, did you know if uh, such a committee existed? No, oh, sir. So you had no knowledge that a committee like this existed? I did not serve on a committee, and I didn't even know it existed. OK. So, so far, we have Silvio Di Bartolome saying, he never attended a meeting. He never knew there was a panel. We have you now saying you never attended, you never knew there was a panel. And we, John, we have a, a John Knapp who was counsel saying he never attended a meeting. Thank you. Th thank you very much, Congressman Shays. Um, we, we, the subcommittee really has two choices. It has the option of uh, asking all the questions of one of our witnesses on all of the subjects, then moving to the other witness and doing the same. Because you occupied the same position, Ms. Hale came in after you left, as I understand it. I think it will be more clear if we deal with a subject, just one subject, and ask both of you about it. So if you'll allow me to turn to Ms. Hale now, um, I would like to deal with this same issue. Ms. Hale, uh, let me state for the record, um, uh, you of course are appearing on a voluntary basis and we are very appreciative of your appearance here. Um, your entire written statement, if you have one, will be entered into the record. 
you may proceed in any way you choose. It would be helpful if you would indicate your service with HUD, your involvement with HUD, and uh, while we are not discussing your present range of responsibilities for the record, you may choose to indicate what position you currently occupy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am pleased to be here today, cooperate with the committee, and answer any and all of your questions. I joined the Department of Housing and Urban Development in 1981 and served in a various capacities through 1986 when I moved to the Department of Transportation. I am currently at the Office of Management and Budget, but I would like to emphasize that I am here testifying on the issues of my involvement while I was at the Department of Housing and Urban Development. We are, we are clearly aware of that, and I appreciate Thank your you. making that clear. Um, you have no opening statement, no, sir, so I we don't. can move to the questions. I would like to pursue the durham hosiery Mill project issue with you. You assumed uh, Ms. Wiseman's position upon her departure from HUD, is that correct? That's correct. Now, how soon after, approximately, I know you can't remember dates specifically, but how soon after Ms. Uh, Wiseman's departure from HUD did the durham hosiery Mill project <coughs> come to your attention? The next day. The next the day. Knowledge, yes. Can you tell us how it came to your attention? I was uh, asked to forward a funding document. When you say forward, and when Ms. Wiseman uses the term forward, does that mean in English approve? The project and my recollection of exactly what happened after that is that the paperwork was either already in the secretary's office or I was asked to send it back upstairs. And I honestly cannot sure. remember which one. I can tell you, sir, that my official action was after the secretary had approved the funding for the mod rehab, I then forwarded it to the funding official who uh, then would process the forms to send it to the field. I actually had to run the computer that I would then sign the forms to send it to the field. Well, let me be sure I follow you. You are on the job <coughs> first day. Who brought the Durham project to your attention? Debbie Dean. In what form? Did she walk into your office and give you documents, or did she telephone you, or did she write a memo to you? Mr. Chairman, I honestly cannot remember that, okay. and I know that's probably important about whether I sent the paperwork back upstairs or whether it came back from downstairs. I cannot remember. I, I, I understand that and I appreciate that, but let me, let me perhaps try to clarify it in a different way. If, if the project already had funding approval, then there was no need for you to approve the funding. Is that correct? I had to formally sign the funding documents that went to the field. You had to do that. After the secretary had given the approval, I was implementing his instructions. All right. So Ms. Dean told you to fund this project? Yes, sir. Can you recall the phrasing that was part of that directive? The secretary wanted the project funded. I had his authorization, and I should move forward with the funding. That's what Ms. Dean told you? Yes. Your testimony is that Ms. Dean said the secretary wanted this project funded, and you should sign the funding documents. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman? Yes, point. of course. I think the wording here is very important. And I want to be clear in the question you're asking that I understand the answer well. And uh, with your permission, please. could we say that Ms. Dean told her that the project was approved? Ask that question. Did she say was the, that the project is approved, sign it and forward it? Congressman, I received a piece of paper called a rapid reply, a part of our process that was the authorization to, to tell our folks to go ahead and cut the funding documents to the field. That had Secretary Pierce's signature on it. Okay. So with that was that, the authorizing that's correct. paper. All right. I, I thank my friend for, for the clarification. Rapid reply was a somewhat of a misnomer because the Durham project has been up there since the 1970s. That's correct. <laughs> this sir. was in 1985 that you were told to sign the rapid right. reply slip. 
That's right. Uh, what did you tell Ms. Dean? By the time I had the secretary's approval for the mod rehab units, acting on the, the authority of my boss, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, I went ahead and forwarded the documents. Were you aware that Ms. Wiseman refused to sign the funding document? Excuse me, Mr. Chairman? Please. Just in terms of forwarding, did you forward it on with your signature or without your signature? My signature. Okay. I'm sorry. M my question was, <coughs> when you signed the funding document, were you aware of the fact that the professional staff objected to the project being funded and that your predecessor, Ms. Wiseman, refused to sign the funding document? I certainly remember the opposition of the career staff. Um, I do not remember whether or not Shirley and I had talked about it. That's fair enough. That's fair enough. Uh, did you, did you uh, call Secretary Pierce to express your objections concerning this project? With the funding authorization already on the documents for MOD rehab, knowing of the concerns about the project, I do not believe I called him at that time. I did try and reach him when I was asked to sign the waivers. All right, explain that a bit. Um, as Mrs. Wiseman has explained, um, this project had several different elements of, of HUD support to yes. it. Low income mod rehab. It also required several waivers of the assistant secretary. For As housing. I recall my research on this, the project required four waivers. One, it required the waiver because it was too close to the railroad tracks. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Secondly, it required the waiver because the project called for a rent figure uh, at 132% above what ordinarily would have been approved. Is that correct? That's correct. So it required the waiver to increase rents by a third. Um, it also required the waiver, I believe, with respect to the the concentration of assisted federally assisted persons in the area. I, do you recall that waiver? What was the third waiver that you recall? I think the third waiver was on the FHA insurance, as I recall, and okay. having had my memory refreshed and getting prepared for this hearing. Um, I believe the three waivers, and again, having not seen them, I'm not sure. totally correct, is that it had to have the 132% of the fair market rents it needed FHA insurance waiver on the occupancy, how much we would assume would be occupied for income flow, and then the- uh, Explain that. Um, in the underwriting criteria used to process the FHA insurance, um, there is a procedure that allows that if you assume you're gonna have a higher occupancy rate, you could in fact get, a, I, I believe it's a higher mortgage limit. Okay, or, and or, or would be used for the mortgage limit and the dollars. That okay, they were and and you do you recall what occupancy figure was proposed that you had to sign off on? I have seen paperwork again, not having seen yes. the actual waivers that said that it was ninety eight percent. And was it reasonable to assume that the project would have ninety eight percent occupancy? Mr. Chairman, I'm was told at the time that that waiver, the package of waivers, and again, I'm, I don't recall the individual comments about any of it. I was told that the career staff opposed the waivers. They did not support the project. Acting on the authority of the secretary having funded the original project, acting on the direction of Deborah Dean, I eventually signed those waivers. Yeah, Ms. Hale, I am in no sense blaming you or okay. criticizing you, and I want this clearly understood. You take a job, and the first day, the person who speaks for the secretary, your boss, comes to you and says, I want you to sign this. And you don't start off your new job by saying, go away. But you said, uh, OK, if the secretary approved it, I signed it. Is that a fair characterization, basically, of what happened? 
that's correct. I would like to put time frame in, in context. I was asked to sign the waivers initially in the spring. I did not sign them then. They were not signed until the fall. Okay. Uh, and the last waiver, I believe, you were asked to sign related to what Ms. Wiseman calls the subsidy upon subsidy upon subsidy thing, that it had both moderate rehabilitation funding and UDAG funding. No, sir, I was not asked to sign the UDAG waiver. That is under the Assistant Secretary for Community Planning and Development. He had to sign he that. He had to sign that. I okay. was asked to, to get sign three only. I was asked to sign three. I was always told that I was asked signing these three to make it UDAG eligible so that the ultimate decision of the last double subsidy that Mrs. Wiseman referred to would be able to be approved. Okay. So let's recapitulate this because this is complex, but it's also important. Ms. Wiseman leaves HUD, you come in, and you sit in her chair. And out of the box, practically the, f the first day, you say, this long, festering problem, which has been sitting at HUD since the 1970s, professional staff strongly opposing it. I've read the quotes of how they oppose it. You're being told by Ms. Dean, executive assistant to Secretary Pierce, secretary approved it. We want you to sign these things. And you sign three waivers, and that colleague of yours signs the fourth wa waiver, and the project goes, goes ahead. Is that a fair characterization? Yes, sir. Later on, uh, or somewhere along this period when you were asked to sign waivers, you attempted to call Secretary Pierce? Yes, sir. Can you tell us about that telephone call that you placed to him? I went up to his office and asked if I could talk to him. He was out of town. Why did you want to talk to him? I wanted to, again, express the concerns I had about the waivers that I was being asked to sign. You felt uneasy about the waivers that you were told to sign by Ms. Dean? That's correct. And they, they were heavily on your conscience, if I may put it that way. Is that accurate? certainly spent a lot of time thinking about him, yes, sir. Was there any other time when you went, physically went up to the secretary's office because something you were told to do bothered you so much, or was this the only time? To the best of my recollection, this is the only time. Well, tell us what happened. Um, eventually, I, uh, Secretary Pierce was out of town, and I, he did call in. And maybe that's when I went up I, uh, oh. to talk to him one way or the other. I was. Uh, yes. Uh, handed the phone and I said that I wanted to talk to him about Durham Hosiery Mill and he indicated that he was out of town and I again cannot remember how the conversation concluded but I had the impression that I would have the opportunity to talk to him. You made it clear to the secretary that you wanted to talk to him about the Durham Hosiery project. To the best of my recollection that's the conversation, yes sir. And he gave you the impression on the phone perhaps that he would be willing to talk to you about it? Yes, sir. Was it clear from your extraordinary request that you talk to the secretary about one project funding that you were disturbed by the fact of being told that you had to do these things? I guess the, the question about extraordinary requests to talk to the secretary, <coughs> I did ask to see him on other matters. Um, and, and was able to. Policy matters, maybe. Yes, sir. But not about, was there any other specific project funding matter on which you requested to see him? No, sir. And it is reasonable to conclude that you requested the opportunity of meeting with the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development because you felt that what you were told to do was really not right. I guess I wanted to be sure that Deborah or the secretary understood, having, having it be now my signature that would be on those documents, that there was tremendous opposition and that, in fact, although these waivers were legal, they were within the bounds of the authority for the assistant secretary to waive, 
but again, the project continued to have opposition from the housing part of the department. And you shared that opposition? I asked to see him. I have told Debbie of that concern uh, and was told that the secretary wanted the project done. Congressman Lukens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am continually, not surprised, I guess, almost amazed at the stage of the game. And I don't mean this in a light or a hypocritical manner, but did you ever get the impression that Debbie Gordine was Secretary of Housing? In selected areas, Deborah Dean had a tremendous amount of responsibility. Then fill me in, if you would, please. And um, I've seen the organizational chart, but the number one person in HUD is secretary. Who is the number two person? The undersecretary. Under secretary. Okay. I've worked for both right. unders and, and deputies. Undersecretary. The chairman is, is it's not. Who is the number three person, or are there more? Are there more than one? There is I'm. One. I am not. I do not remember the delegation well, of authority. Would I, either be. Great. I'm familiar with. I'm just trying for edification right. purposes here for framing this to, to get something in in the. Um, you know, in a manageable form. At what level of authority on the organization chart does Deborah Gordine and her title, what, executive assistant right. to the secretary, enter into the line, the chain of command, the line of authority? She Where is, does she enter into this that she gives orders to anybody? She is not in the chain of command, per se. So she would have a dotted line, uh, direct uh, connection to the secretary. And her access is her authority. Would that be a fair statement? Or was her authority? The I fact that she could walk in and out of that office apparently with, with ease. I'm trying to get a handle on, on right. how this whole department could come to a screeching halt to one young lady who may have many, many uh, you know, virtues, but running HUD was obviously not one of them. And her experience did not qualify her to run HUD. And yet apparently all the testimonies, all the witness we had, they keep running back to this Lady Miss Dean, and I'm trying to, in my mind, understand where she got all this power from. Did everyone assume or did everyone know that she had a direct line uh, channel communication to the secretary? And was that her source of power, simply put? Uh, I think that by any organizational chart, when you say that you're executive assistant to the secretary, you assume that the person that's occupying that office handles the responsibilities that are delegated or given to her by the secretary. Are you aware of any instance where she and the secretary were at odds, and it was public knowledge throughout HUD that they, that they were disagreed over something? Or was she seen as a person who continually and consistently reflected his desires? Is either one of those an accurate characterization of her role? Mr. Lukens, I, I don't remember any, any times when they were, they were known to be at odds, personally. I don't, I just don't remember. Let me go out another way. I'm not trying to be, and I'm trying to be a little incisive and, and capture the essence of what was going on in HUD at this time. Obviously, a great deal was going on that the secretary either was or was not aware of. But the point and the person and the position at which all this came to a head was the executive assistant's position. Is that correct? Almost all action requests went to her first before they went to the secretary? Would that be a correct? I think all paperwork, paper, most paperwork, or if not all, went through Deborah Dean or the executive assistant. Now, following the chairman's lead, let me return to this one inst this one project we're talking about. Your first day in the job, literally, Ms. Dean did speak to you about this project and the funding portion of that project. Or was it the whole project in your box at one fell swoop? Did you inherit the whole mess, if you will, uh, from your predecessor? Was it just all there in front of you? Or was it one aspect that seemed critical at the time, the funding approval? I do not remember whether or not the waivers were attached. My assumption would be that the waivers would not have been attached in a normal co course of time. But it would have been unusual for the waivers to be attached at that point because the funding would normally go to the public housing authority. They would have to select the project. So my assumption of specific waivers attached to a specific project would be that they would, in a normal course of events, not have been attached. That answers my question. In other words, it's not absolutely critical. The whole project and all of the waivers and all the sign-offs would be in one package. It does come together in certain pieces at certain levels. And you, but to your, the best of your knowledge, if I understand your testimony correctly, the first day you were asked to sign off on the funding application. If not the first day, within the first several. Yes, sir. So it really hit you cold. You really, you, 
from your prior experience, your previous time ahead, you were not fully briefed on this project, you were not totally aware of the uh, controversy around the project, you were somewhat aware but not really involved with it. I think that the day. term Durham Hosiery Mill probably was one that I had heard. I had not at all been briefed on any of the subjects at that point, to my knowledge. My recollection. In, I'm sorry. In your short tenure of office in this specific position, did any other project approach the controversial nature that you now conceive from, from the perspective of time past of this project? Was there anything else even close to this? There were projects that clearly were controversial. There were projects that staffs would think were different staffs, different staff opinions, um, different people wanting, different people having different opinions of the projects. Um, this clearly was controversial. Probably in my tenure, there were some other ones that had some level of concern expressed. I do not remember the level being as high as this one. But nothing had so many waivers and so many problems attached to it as this project? To my knowledge and during my tenure, there were not any that came to my attention. And as you already answered, Chairman, I think, uh, if I have it correct again, the only time you went to see the Secretary on a specific project, although it could have been in conjunction with other matters, was on this project. That's correct. The time involved in the day you inherited the job and left it, was approximately six months, uh, is that correct? Six, seven or eight. And during that time, the, from your testimony, the only project that really concerned you enough to seek higher guidance was this project. There was obviously a great deal of concern attached to it where you were concerned. You were worried about signing off on the waivers. Yes. I think that makes the point, but I must state again for the record, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I am astounded that an agency this size and government that's supposed to run for the people on people's time, people's money, and people's buildings could come to a screeching halt for one person who really doesn't have a line, a direct line authority anywhere. I'm just, that, that does amaze me. Thank you very much. Congressman Martinez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, on the idea that this project was controversial, as Mr. Yeah, Hickman exactly. said, Ms. Hale, uh, and you know, you said on another project there were people who were of different opinions on each particular project. And that's probably a good thing that we have several people, different people reviewing projects, and a consensus comes forth. But on this project, do you know of anyone on anyone other than? Mr. Pierce and uh, Deborah Dean, who thought the project was good, who wanted the project? Was there anybody, any other staff people? Seems like the, what, the testimony we've heard so far is that all the professional staff said no, no, no. To my knowledge, there was no one else that supported the project within the building. I really don't think that the opinion of two people, who it seems is apparent at this time anyway, had some special interest reason for seeing that project forward, that that makes it a controversial project. It really was a project that was everybody that had any uh, real reason to be responsible was against it, including yourself. Is that true? Yes, sir. Uh, one of the things that I'm still a little confused on, and you can clarify it for me, is, uh, well, two things. Did you, uh, before I get into the other, uh, did you voice, you voiced your opposition to Deborah Green, is that right? Yes, sir. You uh, voiced your opposition, did you finally get to voice your opposition to Samuel Pierce? I never met with him personally on this project, no, sir. So you were never able to, uh, but in any way on the phone did you? Only that one, one brief phone call. And in that phone call, <clears throat> did you voice your opposition to it? Did you get a chance to voice your opposition to it, or did you just request a meeting? My guess is that I requested the meeting. All right. Well then, other than those, the, the, the times you say you did voice your opposition, did you do it in any kind of a written form? Any, or, did, or did you talk about your opposition to any other pe members of the staff? There was nothing written of my opposition. Um, I talked about my opposition to 
my immediate staff and um, sought talk briefly to the general counsel to be sure that I had the, the legal authority to sign the waivers and um, probably at some point talk to him about it. In, in your conversation with the general counsel, did you uh, suggest to him that uh, you really didn't approve the project, uh, but you felt you were under orders by the secretary and, and uh, Deborah Dean to forward the materials since, and did you felt that it was on their authority that you were doing it? Yes, sir. Uh, did you at any time during that period of time feel, um, as you became acquainted with your responsibility and duties, uh, that you must have, because I think you indicated earlier that you did, had a feeling that somehow your name was going to be on it, but did so felt some responsibility. But did you ever feel that it was your exclusive authority to say no, as did Ms. Weissman, and say you sign it and forward it? Uh, on the waivers, I did not at the time think about sending them upstairs to have Secretary Pierce's signature on them. By that time, the mod rehab funding was already on it, on his authority and, and Deborah's. And so from that perspective, uh, having heard his opinion, at least being expressed on the project, having talked to Deborah about the concerns I had, um, I did not think about sending them back upstairs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Congressman Kyle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just two questions. You were not able to, to have the meeting with the Secretary, but you did speak with Deborah Gordine after you tried to set that meeting up. Uh, on When you spoke with her, did you express to her your concerns and the concerns of the staff again? And um, if so, what was her response? Um, Deborah indicated the Secretary wanted the project to move forward. I think I asked her, could I talk to the secretary personally about it? Uh, Deborah was an individual that could forcefully argue the issues, forcefully make her point, and we had conversations about it. But so she forcefully made the point that the secretary wanted it, that was it, your concerns notwithstanding, sign the waivers. Is that a fair characterization of what happened? As I have said to other people, it is so difficult for me to remember three years later what actual words did the Secretary wanted, did she want it. To me, they were all intermeshed in my memory about the fact that I was to sign the waivers. That was the gist of it in yeah. any event. Uh, the second question concerns the exact uh, uh, programs involved. There was the moderate rehabilitation with rent subsidies, and the insurance was FHA insurance, is That's that correct? That's correct. And then there were UDAG, it, it, w were there UDAG funds? It is my understanding that it, there were UDAG funds. Were there any other programs or subsidies or monies or guarantees or insurance uh, involved in the project, to your knowledge? Not from the Department of Housing, to my knowledge, no. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Congressman Shays. I, I'm trying to put myself in both of your positions. and. Um, Ms. Hale, I, I want to ask you a question or two, and it, it's not an unfriendly question, but I, the reason why I'm asking it is I want to put in perspective um, just what kind of pressure may have been applied or not, and to really have a, a feeling of where Secretary Pierce, Pierce and Deborah Gordon get involved in this, um, and also to make sure if there's any others who try to influence on this project. So let me just begin with that. Did Hunter Cushing or anyone else speak to you about this project? It's a broad question. I'm asking you about one person, then I'm saying anyone else. Let's take Hunter Cushing did not talk to me about it. Did anyone else try to convince you in the, uh, did anyone who was a career employee tell you this is a bad project, don't move forward on it? You already knew they didn't want right. you to move forward, but I'm interested to know if any just said, you know, whatever pressure you get, don't move forward on this. Um, my guess is that probably some of the multifamily staff did. I do not remember the specific instances, and they may not have. They may have just been telling my, my, my staff. I don't but it's very clear that they didn't feel it was a good project. There's no doubt about it, sir. There's no doubt about the fact that career employees thought this was a bad project. That's correct. Now, um, you have... Uh, uh, 
Ms. Weissman, who basically said to the secretary she was not going to sign off on this project. Uh, and she left right after, for whatever reason. Uh, what was your feeling of why she left? Did you feel, did you feel that her refusal to sign off on this project, did you know that she had, had decided not to sign off on this project? Uh, let, me, let, me, let me say this and just set the stage a second. You've made it, it clear uh, to this committee that this was not a project while you were new on the job. And, and I concur with, with the chairman's comments that uh, you've been given a new assignment, you are acting, you are not the uh, uh, FHA um, commissioner, you are an act, in an acting role, uh, you're new and, and you know through uh, uh, the secretary's chief assistant who has extraordinary powers as you pointed out, says he wants the project. So I have lots of sympathy for that. And, and I don't know what I would have done if I were in your shoes. So I'm not passing judgment about that right now. But I, but I do want to know this. It, uh, it's, it, you gave the impression to this committee earlier, not in this hearing, but to staff uh, and to me as well, that you knew about this project before. This is some project that had been talked about for a while. Is that not correct? Uh, as I have said before, I certainly knew the name Durham Hosiery Mill. I did not know the specifics before um, I took, I did not know the specifics of the project before I became the acting general deputy. You knew it was a very controversial project, is that not correct? I knew the name. I'm, I knew that there were problems with the project. Did I know it was controversial? Can, uh, can I you, mean, you sit in staff meetings and hear names of projects a lot. Um, those, that was not my area of, ex of responsibility. It was not one that I focused on. So I did not know before I became acting of the issues involved with this project. Let me just um, back off a second. Ms. Ms. Weissman, I, I know that you left to, to go on to better things. But uh, uh, is, can I infer in any way that one of the reasons you decided to leave HUD was that you had a significant agree disagreement with the secretary and felt that uh, you had put yourself in a bad situation with the number one man in the, uh, in the department? No, sir. Okay. So your leaving um, uh, had nothing to do with, uh, th this project had nothing absolutely to do with your leaving and no one could infer that, including me. No, sir. I, I left for one specific reason and that was to run for office and uh, my difference with the secretary was just a difference and I wasn't going to do it and I left for the reason that I stated. Do you think he was sorry to see you go? I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I doubt it too. <laughs> uh, would the gentleman yield on that question? Sure. Did you ever have the feeling, Ms. Weisman, that... Uh, I can't hear you. Uh, did you... Did you ever have the feeling, Ms. Wiseman, that uh, in this whole process, this isn't the way it's supposed to work. This is this sucks. <laughs> That's maybe not exactly the way I stated it, but uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, let me let me just say very seriously, I I come from a long business background, and I felt that maybe it was an inappropriate way for me to operate. Well, if, if you didn't feel that you could operate that way, you, in a sense, you really didn't feel it was right. I, I didn't say it sucks, but I said close to it. <laughs> <laughs> I yield back. <laughs> Let the record show that Ms. Wiseman thought the programs were not handled with total propriety. Actually, Mr. <laughs> Chairman, I, thank you, sir. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I just asked if she'd autograph that page of the transcript for me when it comes back. <laughs> Congressman Shays. I, I, I have a better feeling now of, 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 of the situation that you arrived in. There, was, there wasn't this great scandal of HUD that said uh, Ms. Wiseman had left, that she wouldn't sign off on a particular project, and you're being asked to come in. Uh, and, and, and do her dirty work. But you, you took over, and this is a project you knew a little about, so you were pretty curious about it. Um, the secretary, uh, through Deborah Gordine, asked you to sign this project. And you signed the project and sent it up 
the, the, uh, sent the forms up to the secretary? What I cannot remember is whether the funding documents for the mod rehab were already up there or whether I sent them up. I, I don't remember that step of the process in my early days. I know the other committee members have, um, have asked this, and I'm just unclear as to, uh, I touched on this, uh, the, the waivers, the three waivers that you signed, you were asked to sign them in the spring, and you signed them in the fall. Is that not correct? That's correct. I need to have a very clear sense of, of, of why it took so long and what kind of interaction took place. Did you have... Uh, the reason for the request to sign them in the spring and then the requ specific request to sign them in the fall is that I was asked to make this project. It had to be all the way through its housing processing for each of the areas to make it UDAG eligible. In the spring, when I was asked to sign the waivers, after I had been there for probably several weeks, having learned more of the project, having heard the allegations that it was on a toxic waste site, as the chairman referred to, I refused to sign the documents because one of those documents I had to sign was a site and neighborhood standards waiver. I was not willing, and told Deborah, I was not willing to sign those waivers with the allegations that it was on a hazardous waste site. Okay. And so what proceeded then? With that it was one? not funded in the spring. The project probably popped up periodically. And in the Let me ask you this. Did, did you have a, a space a box behind your, your desk uh, like Ms. Weissman? Yes, it was the same box. Okay. <laughs> Sat in her chair, so yes, sir. Um, I, who knows if paperwork stayed in there. Um, when the waiver, when it became time again to make it UDAG eligible for the fall UDAG round, I was asked to sign the waivers again. I asked staff to check to be sure that the land had been inspected. Given staff conversation, with the field office, I was told that it had been inspected and that there was no um, evidence of toxic waste. So your career people in this instance uh, said it, it had been signed <coughs> off and the problem did no longer exist. I'm a little unclear. Were these political people telling you this or career people? Was this Deborah Gordine telling you this? No, no sir, problem? it was not Deborah Gordine. I asked staff to call down to the Greensboro office and ask them if it had been inspected, if there were still the allegations. This is a local PHA? Greensboro Area Office is the HUD, region, uh, HUD Area Office. I believe that's where this and, project and went through. did you see a document that said? I did not, sir. Okay. Do we know if such a document exists? I do not. Okay. Would, ordinarily you, uh, <clears throat> would it be ordinary for you to see a document before you would sign off on uh, Congressman, I'm not totally I do not remember the waiver authority of who had the waiver authority for site and neighborhood standards. It may well have had the authority down in the area office. When the waiver came up to me, I, and again, not having seen the waivers, you know, maybe I should have asked to be sure that there was a documentation. I did not, um, but I was told that, that it was clean. Will my friend yield for a moment? I think it's appropriate here again, and uh, this does not necessarily relate to your testimony, but to the subject my colleague is exploring. Uh, in the file dated September 24, 1984, there is a HUD career employee notation which reads as follows. The hosiery mill project has been a source of ill feeling in the field regarding the undue pressure applied by the central office of the FHA staff during the grant review period, including, for example, a directive by central office that the area office of FHA specifically not put anything into the FHA commitment regarding an environmental problem with the site. So somebody in central office FHA directed the area office FHA, don't say a word about environmental problems on the site. 
I thank my friend for yielding. Mr. Chairman, for the record, would you again say the date of that? Yes, I'll be very happy to. It, it's September 24, 1984. Which is uh, the fall season. Sir, that's a year before that's I That's a year before you, you dealt with it. That's absolutely correct. Well, then let me, let me just pursue that a second, just to make sure we're clear on this. You were under uh, significant pressure, were you not, to sign off on the waivers? Yes, sir, I was. Okay. Uh, you felt that pressure from whom again? Deborah Dean. Okay. Uh, and how was it manifested in the fall? Um, pressure to sign the waivers that were on my, it, it had now come up from the area office to sign the three waivers that were there, the 98% of occupancy, the 132% of fair market rents, and the site and waiver, uh, site and neighborhood standard that I understood was for the railroad tracks. I, I really need to be clear, and I, uh, I am not clear as to what pressure was basically applied. Did Deborah Gordine say, you know, the secretary liked this, I want it, it's a good project, or you better get your act together and, and, and sign these off, we're getting near the cutoff time. I mean, how, give me a sense of the, of the feeling uh, of, about the pressure that might have been put on you. Uh, were you a willing accomplice at this point, or were you still a little reluctant? And let me, before you answer, let me give you a little more time to think about this, because I, I want to be very fair to you here. We will have people locally come and testify to uh, their response, including this whole issue of whether or not someone spoke to you and said, yes, the, the environmental issue had been taken care of, the toxic situation had been taken care of. You spoke with someone locally. Who was that? In I spoke to someone on my staff, sir. Okay. Not in not in the Greensboro office. So you ha never had a conversation locally. Not on the Who on your staff region? did you speak to? Uh, Tom Casey. How do I spell that last name? I do. C a s e y. Okay. So Tom Casey said that part had been taken care of. That's correct. Okay. Now, as to my recollection. Right. Uh, who? Um, how was the pressure applied? Um, Deborah. And I, I just need to, to be certain. You knew that the secretary wanted it. It wasn't Deborah Gordine saying, I want it. She said, I want this. The, the secretary wants it. I mean, was that clear to you? Once the decision was clear that he wanted the mod rehab funding, knowing that it was a project that would require my judgment, once he knew, if he approved the mod rehab, the waivers then were a natural part of it trying to get it ready for UDAG. Since we were not part of the UDAG decision-making process in housing. Um, for the record, UDAG means Urban Development Action Grant. That's correct. Is that correct? Thank you. I was told the secretary wanted it. Deborah asked me to sign the waivers. The secretary having already approved the mod rehab funding as I have testified before, sir, maybe I should have sent the waivers upstairs, too. I did not. So you signed it, and you didn't. By then, it, you had just decided you were going to sign it. I was told to sign them, and I did, sir. Okay. Um, I had asked earlier uh, from Ms. Weissman if um, she had been part of this committee that the secretary had pointed out this was, uh, this was a sensitive area. We no longer had the, the regulations that appeared to have a competitive process on giving mod rehab units. So it had been centralized. And we have the secretary in his testimony to us and Deborah Gordine to the IG saying there was this committee established to decide who got what. Um, did you know a committee like this existed? And did you ever participate in any meetings? It is no to both of those questions. Pardon me? It is no to both of those questions. No to knowing, uh, the ever attending meeting, no to even knowing that a, that a committee existed. That's correct. Okay. The, um, this project appears to be very unique, aside from the fact that this whole testimony is unique in that we have the secretary saying he never tried to influence a project, and we have two of you uh, making it very clear to us that he tried to influence this project and have it move forward in the department. 
uh, we have both of you uh, concurring with that. And that is extraordinarily significant testimony, as I'm sure you're aware. But what makes it also more significant is that uh, it appears that the secretary uh, knew some of the developers and had a business relationship with one of them, uh, possibly in his law firm, uh, uh, as had, had had a relationship with the individual who would benefit from this project. Now, what also made it unusual was you had a, it appears, and I want to know if this is unusual or not, you have a UDAG grant involved in this, you have city mortgage revenue bonds, you have community uh, development block grants, you have this whole issue of equity, you had rent subsidy, and you had tax credits. Um, is it unusual to combine rent subsidies, uh, the mod rehab, the UDAG, and the HODAG all together, or was this fairly common? There was, during my tenure, there was no HODAG money. Um, I don't know whether or not any was added. I would suggest there probably wasn't any HODAG. Um, mod rehab and, and UDAG, best of my knowledge, is not normally done. Not normally done. Uh, Ms. Wiseman? It's not normally done. Um, I'd like to just both of you to comment on a, um, an investigation for, uh, in the IG's um, office in regard to this particular, um, the durham Hosiery Mill Urban Development Action Grant application. At the bottom it says, uh, a new policy initiated by C in July 1985 authorized Section 8 mod rehab funds to be counted as private investment in conjunction with UDAG projects. Subsequently, the durham Hosiery Mill project became the first project in which Section 8 mod rehab funding was counted as private leverage. Can you comment on this and tell me the significance of this, either one of you? I uh, would think that it was uh, you, it would be hard to define mod rehab as being private funds. So, but I am not I am not familiar with that waiver. I mean, I'm not familiar with that policy, and so I mean, if you're asking my personal opinion about whether or not you would count mod rehab as private funds, I would not. Wiseman, I wouldn't think it would be appropriate to count mod rehab funds as personal funds. What's, yeah, what's significant about this, it appears to me, is this is the second time where we have John Knapp involved. The first time uh, it appeared, uh, as far as the department was concerned, as far as the IG was concerned, that he had waived the regulations governing the competitive process for mod rehab. And now we also have uh, a verbal opinion again, it appears, uh, Mr. Knapp allowing this kind of process to happen as well, and that's the reason why I asked. And you've confirmed to me that, in your judgment, it was very unusual. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, if I may summarize uh, in a few simple sentences, it seems to me we had a project that has been languishing in the department for years, long before either of you ladies were anywhere near the department. Uh, career staff objected to this project for all of the reasons that both you have stated and I have quoted. And in differing ways, uh, it was made clear to you uh, that Secretary Pierce was determined to have this project deemed unacceptable by professional staff funded that both of you in differing ways expressed your opposition, your disagreement, but the project was nevertheless funded because the secretary wanted it funded. Now I would like to shift gears and move to an entirely different arena where both of you have a great deal of knowledge and expertise. The next topic we will deal with is uh, the involvement of a company known by its initials DRG and the coinsurance program. To set the stage, if I may ask you, Ms. Wiseman, could you, in not as president of the National Association of Home Builders, where you talk to lots of people who understand these things very well, but in, in lay terms, can you explain what coinsurance is 
so we can start with a common base. Coinsurance is, is uh, multifamily mortgagees who uh, are approved by the department to underwrite projects and take on a portion of the risk. Uh, insurance, FHA insurance takes on one portion of the risk and the private mortgagee takes on uh, a small portion of the risk and they, they do the underwriting uh, with some rev review cases by the department. They also do the appraising. Yes, they, they do the entire packaging <coughs> to make test case submissions before they are fully approved to do uh, total underwriting without review process. All right, and basically, we are oversimplifying a bit, but basically the way this program worked, the private underwriter theoretically assumed about 19% of the risk. The federal government in, uh, assumed 21% of the risk. Is that correct? 81. 19% and 81%. Yes. Yes. Um, Absolutely. And this program presumably works as long as the appraisals are correct, as long as it's run honestly, as long as there are no shenanigans, as long as HUD has the capability and the determination to review things properly. Is that correct? That was the theory behind it. That, that is the theory, theory behind it, and appropriately operated, it's a, a program that can work. I fully agree with you. Appropriately operated, it's a program that can, can work. But let me give a hypothetical example where it wouldn't work. And I'm going to, I'm going to use a, um, I am going to use a, a single family example because the, the dollar figures are easier. If, um, if I have a house that has a real value of $100,000 and uh, the mortgage insurance company says that it's worth $200,000 uh, and they are responsible for 20% of the risk, 20% on $200,000 would be $40,000, correct? Then I, as the federal government, assume $160,000 worth of risk on a house that's worth only $100,000. And if this is the way it works, then it's an abuse and opens up tremendous opportunities for fraud, illegal profiteering, bankruptcies, and the taxpayer being stuck with the bill. Is that correct? Inappropriate underwriting it certainly would could lead to all those things. Right. Well, let me then, with this very <laughs> oversimplified background of what coinsurance is, uh, ask you about when the company DRG came to your attention as uh, uh, General Deputy Assistant Secretary. I, I was aware of uh, DRG Financial uh, when I first came to the department because they were an approved mortgagee who were involved with several programs in the department. Uh, they later applied, and I, uh, let me just clarify a please, situation. Please. When, when I became the General Deputy Assistant Secretary for Housing, Maurice Barksdale was the Assistant Secretary. His expertise was multifamily. My expertise and experience was single family, and we clearly defined the lines that he looked at uh, with a uh, close scrutiny at multifamily projects, and I uh, would oversee the single family projects. But during that period of time that coinsurance was being uh, put in place, I, I was briefed and kept up to date in the reviewing process, the test and trial cases, and, and ultimately my real involvement was that I learned that DRG had uh, perhaps committed some infractions and were placed on review status, and uh, they, the review status would require that they could uh, underwrite, but it had to be reviewed by the central office. And that was basically where I became involved with any intimate knowledge of the uh, transactions. All right. <coughs> they, they were singled out, correct me if I'm wrong, they were singled out among the various companies that were involved in this business for what I believe HUD called 
pre-clearance obligation. Is that correct? I, I, be I believe that's correct, yes, sir. So before they could do any more underwriting, they had to get the prior approval of HUD for that specific new underwriting? Yes, review process, yes. But it was a pre-clearance review? Yes. It was not a post review it was a pre-review yes. so for instance at this stage where you become involved in having to deal with them another mortgage company mortgage company X could start the project appraise the project underwrite the project submit the papers to HUD and HUD would routinely process it and uh, you would be responsible for 81% of the risk, and that private company X would be responsible for 19% of the risk. But DRG didn't have that privilege. DRG, when it had a project, had to come to HUD first, show the project, and had, have HUD approve the project in advance, and then they could make a mortgage commitment. Prior to the insurance, that's Prior correct. to the insurance, okay. That was a red flag, wasn't it? It was a flag of caution. It indicated that this particular company wasn't doing, hadn't been doing certain things right. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been put on probation. This is like a student being put on probation. And if a student has unacceptable grades, then you, go, then you get on the dean's probation list. And the dean tells you, unless you clean up your act, you'll be out. Is that about fair? I think that's a fair statement, yes. All right. Let me ask you, Ms. Hale, just to establish the basic fact. Is your understanding of coinsurance the same that Ms. Wiseman and I share? Yes. All right. Is it your understanding with respect to the pre-clearance issue the same that we seem to be sharing? that they were put on the pre-clearance list because they had done s several things wrong. I was not involved at right. that time on the DRG pre-clearance uh, and to the best of my knowledge never was involved in the DRG pre-clearance issue. So um, my understanding would only be of what surely in, in a general sense. sense. That's correct. Okay. Now tell me if you will Ms. Wiseman about a meeting you had with DRG officials and Ambassador Carla Hills with respect to DRG's pre-clearance problem. Well, let me preface when Please. it was because I don't know and I have, I have not searched the records. Right. It was either in late 84 when Secretary Barksdale was on travel or uh, January to May of 85 when I was acting in that capacity. All right. uh, there was a meeting set up with officials from uh, DRG, their, I don't know if it was their president or whomever, but Secretary Hills was there representing DRG uh, and made the case to the staff and to me uh, to have the, uh, the underwriting restrictions lifted and to reinstate them to, uh, uh, to full coinsurance uh, ability. To underwrite. Um, we had that meeting. Uh, the professional staff from multifamily was there. Uh, I was there, Secretary Hills, and officials from DRG. We heard their case and advised the Secretary at that time that we would take it under advisement. Um, that was the end of the conversation. Uh, we later, we being the multifamily staff, and I went over the documentation, reviewed the uh, concerns of the professional staff that DRG was not performing uh, underwriting in, in the, the manner that the professionals would uh, deem appropriate, and therefore uh, they were notified that we could not lift the restrictions. All right, so let me review where we are so far. Uh, Someone at HUD, certainly not you, but someone at HUD, uh, who in my view should be labeled as one of HUD's heroes because he hoisted a flag of caution, whoever this 
lady or gentleman was, said DRG is not doing it right. And while every other mortgage company can do business as initially envisioned, DRG has to be put by itself on a watch list. Not only on a watch list, but on a, on a list that does not allow them to do any more business unless for each specific business transaction they get the prior approval of HUD. That's correct. Following this placing of DRG on probation, a meeting was set up uh, involving uh, former secretary of HUD, Carla Hills, and DRG uh, management, top staff, whoever, and you, because you were in that position by that time, or you were pinch hitting for your yes. colleague. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. And that meeting entailed a sizable group of people, eight people, six people, 12 people, whatever. And um, Secretary Hills made her pitch at the meeting. Yes, sir. Her presentation basically said, uh, well, what did it say? It was unfair that DRG was put on this uh, unique list of just one company or that they have removed uh, the problems? Or, or do you recall basically what her presentation I, was? I, I don't recall the presentation. I, I do recall that uh, Secretary Hills indicated that the problems that the professional staff had, uh, had shared with DRG officials had been corrected. And uh, that's basically the only thing that I remember, and it was not a convincing argument to the professionals. Was it convincing to you? No, sir. So, it, so the arguments were convincing neither to you nor to your professional staff, but you directed your professional staff to restudy the issue. We, we looked at the issues that uh, they had been put on uh, this clearance, reclearance type uh, situation for. Uh, the professional staff reviewed it again. We discussed it and, and they felt that uh, nothing had been changed or nothing significant had been done to correct the problems and they were, uh, candidly, they were m very, very concerned about, uh, about the underwriting. They were very concerned about the underwriting, and this was either in late 84 or early 85. Yes, sir. At that point, um, your office notified either DRG, I presume, or Secretary Hills, who at that time was in private law practice, of course. Yes, sir, and I'm not sure which one. One of the two was yes. notified saying, your request to have this pre-clearance restriction removed is rejected. Is denied, yes. Is denied. Yes. What happened after that? Uh, we, we being housing, uh, did nothing. Uh, it was later brought to my attention that uh, Secretary Hills had gone to Secretary Pierce and, and uh, taken the case to Secretary Pierce. You were not involved at that time? I was not at the meeting, no, sir. But to the best of your knowledge, there was a meeting between Secretary Hills and Secretary Pierce. I was informed by staff that there was a meeting. Is it reasonable to conclude that s since you as the individual who had properly in charge of this arena denied the request, on the basis of your professional staff's recommendation and your own judgment and concurrence. At that point, Secretary Hills decided to go to Secretary Pierce, presumably in an attempt to have your decision overruled. Is that a fair inference? I would think that's a fair statement. I'm sorry, I can't. I, I would think that's a fair statement, yes, sir. You would think that's a fair statement. And it is your testimony that, in fact, your ruling and the professional staff's ruling that pre-clearance -cle pre obligation not be lifted was overruled by Secretary Pierce. I don't honestly know that for a fact, but 
I, they were reinstated at some point. Okay. And you did not do the reinstate? No, sir, I did not reinstate them. Congressman Lukens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a couple of brief questions on this. What percentage of coinsurance work did DRG have? Were they the largest player in the game? I don't know, sir. According to Secretary um, Kemp's testimony before our subcommittee a week ago, the total programs are at a billion four dollars, one point four billion dollars in coverage, of which there's been a five hundred million dollar default. And I, I got the impression from that testimony, Mr. Chairman, that that was just the DRG portion of coverage. Now, not having a grip on the figures of the type of coverage offered by the private sector, I don't know whether that's the total program or just DRG. Would either of you ladies venture a guess as to whether that was part of the coverage or just DRG? I don't, I don't know. Well, I don't rather uh, stump spin trying to find out exactly how big a player DRG was and if that default, which is almost a third, 33% default, uh, in fact, a little bit more than that, of that part of the program, I just wonder how secure and how well run, obviously, the rest of the program was. Now, neither of you ladies had any uh, involvement with the co-insurance program as such. Uh, very limited involvement in the, the five to six months that I was in, in charge of housing. Uh, that's basically limited. Does, is the co-insurance, uh, that concept, a greater player in the multi-unit uh, housing or in single housing? Is there a difference uh, that, that the, the policy extend everything? The multifamily is called co-insurance and the mortgagees are, are approved as co-insuring lenders. Under the single family program, it's called uh, direct endorsement, and the underwriting is done by, uh, by m approved mortgagees under a direct endorsement program. But in essence, you had nothing to do with the co-insurance program except on that one occasion of any significance. I was there, but as I said, Secretary Barksdale, 99% um, um, of the time when he was there I had oversight on multifamily. I on single family and only my limited access while I was uh, the acting assistant secretary. And to Ms. Hale, had you ever had any meetings at all on coinsurance during your tenure in office? Certainly I met on coinsurance when I was the acting assistant secretary. Um, again, like Shirley getting briefed on the program, that was um, not something I had handled before I went in to be the acting assistant, acting general deputy. Um, were you aware of DRG's role in this area? Yes, sir. Had their situation come to your attention during your brief tenure? Yes, sir. I, I was um, an acting general deputy at the time trying to establish the monitoring office that would be sure that if there were any questions about the underwriting standards or any of the practices that were occurring by the approved co-insured lenders, that we would in fact have an active staff and it would take appropriate follow-up action. Could you briefly summarize the subcommittee then? Uh, what kind of activities took place in order to ensure that a more uh, sane and more responsible program of coinsurance did in fact exist? Obviously, there was concern in the department, uh, and out of that grew this task force or study group that, to which you refer. Could you explain? It was that? actually, we, we tried to establish a monitoring office so that in fact we would have post endorsement follow-up actions so that if there were abuses, if there were questions of how an approved co-insured lender was operating the program, we would have more knowledge about it, would be actually able to document the cases and the problems, and then hopefully take strong follow-up enforcement action after the uh, information was gathered. What about the pre-endorsement process to which the chairman already alluded his question? Was any attention paid to that by your office, monitoring office or office of monitoring, whatever you call it? What was the official title? Well, it was in the office of multifamily, and I, I don't remember the name. Well, what is for purpose here called the monitoring office? But there, there is a monitoring office, but it's in the office of single family and does not monitor uh, coinsurance. At the oh. time, both Shirley and I were there. 
there was not an official monitoring office, but we were attempting to set up one during my co tenure. For well, co which brings several questions to mind. Uh, the chairman questioned about the pre-clearance uh, obligation, and now we're talking about post-endorsement uh, uh, process. And I'm just wondering how the two mesh. Did this? There was a staff that was assigned responsibility in the multifamily office for doing three pre-case review, bringing cases in of the. The, uh, in the lenders who were trying to be, gather co-insurance status. And those cases were actively reviewed by the multifamily staff to see if they would, in fact, use the HUD-approved underwriting criteria. I, I guess I didn't quite understand then the total responsibility of this new Office of Monitoring to which you referred. The only were, st statement I had from you, in my recollection, is that it dealt with post-endorsement follow through, which is fine. I'm just wondering if we, if it missed out on the pre-clearance uh, process or if it was part of that Office of Monitoring. Was it, were there two separate functions, two separate desks, two separate individuals, or does the Office of Monitoring have the responsibility and the authority to look at pre-clearance and conduct pre-clearances as well as post-endorsement activity? We were trying to establish during my tenure the post-monitoring office. It is my recollection that we wanted to keep them separate so that there would not be a question of whether or not you had the people that were approving the lenders in the beginning also doing the monitoring afterwards. I do not know how it was eventually established, sir. That clears up for me. Thank you very much. I was assuming that there would be a follow-through procedure that would be held uh, in one office. One it was all under the Office of Multifamily, though, so that there was, in fact, an Office of Multifamily, and then these would have been subsets of that office. Yes, and uh, my, my follow-up question, Mr. Chairman, is very simply, I was also concerned about the possibility of those who do the pre-clearing also doing the monitoring. And I understand that you have separated this function, which makes sense at this stage of the game. One additional question. Uh, how are these insurance or co-insurance private enterprise units originally screened? What kind of screening process do they go through to gain the, the primary or initial acceptance or endorsement into the HUD co-insurance program? Is there much of a screening process? They just have to be simply in existence, operating profitably on the outside? Uh, is there an office that has to you know, screen them and approve them? There, there's, first of all, they must be an approved mortgagee. And they must meet the requirements of being an approved mortgagee with the, the monetary limits and so on and so forth. And then to be a co-insuring co lender, they have to go through another process of submitting cases and other, other requirements of which I can't tell you exactly. You interruption, but unique to HUD. That's what's really the process is unique to HUD. Yes. OK, that's what we're getting yes. at. Is there, is there yes. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Congressman Martinez. Uh, yes, uh, Ms. Hale, Ms. Wiseman, maybe either one of you or maybe somebody in the staff can tell me. Uh, what percentage of multifamily housing uh, uh, mortgage finance and co-insurance did DR day, uh, DRG do of the total that was done through HUD? I don't know. Does, does anybody in the staff know? What percentage of total multifamily housing uh, financing and mortgage financing and co-insuring did uh, DRG do? Um, the, the secretary's statement at his hearing to us was that the, the major share of the loss, the major portfolio in default is a DRG portfolio. So assuming they It was the major player. They were the major player. Yeah, go ahead. The Inspector General, when he testified before us at the June 30th hearing on co-insurance, testified that three out of five, 60 percent of the problem co-insurance loans that he saw in 1985 by D DRG have matured to pending or actual claims. Well, they, they were substantial then. Uh, this is, to me, a maze of perversion although DRG would probably call it creative uh, financing. As I understand it, they uh, were the appraiser, they were the money lender, and they were the co-insurer. Is that right? 
the co-insurer takes on the responsibilities that the department used to administer just uh, routinely. They uh, assume a portion of the liability and do all of the processing as the appraiser, um, as the lender, and uh, the closer. Then the final HUD insurance is, is put in place. Well, you know, the picture I draw, and maybe in too simple a term, is that uh, uh, one, you have a person that's appraising a piece of property who is eventually going to be the money lender, who also is going to underwrite the 19% of the insurance for it. Seems to me that it would follow that if you had this creative financing inclination, that you then appraise for greater than the value of the property, so you're going to mortgage for greater than poverty, so the insurance is going to be greater. So that, and eventually, even if you underwrite 19% of it, if you then claim against the FHA for the 81% and uh, are paid off the mortgage that was foreclosed, you then are, since the appraiser was higher than the property value initially, that you probably clear what the actual value of the property was, so you haven't lost anything. You, you've actually come out smelling like a rose, as they say. Is that true? I'm afraid you've uh, described some instances of what's happened. You know, and to me, where they might think that's creative finance, and I think that's creative, that's perversion, perversion of the program. Um, it, you know, you talked about the monitoring <coughs> aspects of it that you were trying to set in place. Why didn't anybody think to, let's say, we've heard so often the phrase, the, the fox watching the chicken coop. Uh, in this case, the fox wasn't watching the chicken coop. He was inside the chicken coop eating all the chickens. And uh, why didn't anybody ever think that, hey, uh, that kind of arrangement isn't really a kind of an arrangement that provides the safeguard against uh, taking advantage? Uh, you know, I've always had, you know, on the, uh, the other subcommittee I sit on, on, how, on in government operations, which was recently dealing with uh, a lot of the foreclosures of the savings and loans. A lot of that was done because properties were overappraised, and it, it always turned out that in those cases of overappraisal of properties, it was the mortgage lender themselves or the financial institution itself that was doing the appraisal. And the biggest uh, uh, infraction was not necessarily uh, inflating the property to the so much greater than the property value and getting big loans on it that were eventually foreclosed, but the smaller portions which were just appraising so that there was no down payment necessary. And when a person hasn't any money invested in a piece of property, they can walk away from it. And in a sense, that's what's happened here. And if you don't have any of your own capital in something, it's very easy for you to walk away from it. It starts to turn sour. Why wasn't anybody in the, in the whole department ever cognizant of the fact that you don't have the person who's eventually going to do the co-insuring and the mortgage lending doing the appraisal? You would end up, or having independent, you know, the, we and other uh, the, uh, government departments have a list of uh, certified appraisers in which go out and appraise AVHA housing. Why didn't they use that system here? Does anybody know? Uh, I, can't, the I, I can't answer that except on the single family side. We have an approved list of appraisers uh, that's kept at the department and, and they are used uh, routinely uh, from that roster. I, I can't answer on the, the co insurance side, sir. I have no other question. Well, I want to thank my friend, and before I call on my colleague from Arizona, just would like to reinforce your very effective questioning on that point. Um, when we had Mr. Adams in here, uh, he stated uh, the following. Uh, I'm quoting from page 15 of, uh, of uh, the June 30 hearing, transcript of the hearing. Mr. Adams, we found continuing significant problems in loan underwriting. Mr. Lantos, what were they? Mr. Adams, basically the same ones we observed earlier. Inflated appraisals, overestimates of incomes, and occupancy rates. Mr. Lantos, let me stop you on those for a moment. Who did the appraisals under this program? Mr. Adams, 
the employees of the lender. Mr. Lantos, and what review did these appraisals get from HUD? Mr. Adams, none other than through some periodic monitoring of the lender by the department. Mr. Lantos, did the lender did his own appraisal? Mr. Adams, yes, sir. Mr. Lantos, and HUD merely accepted whatever appraisal the lender provided? Mr. Adams, that is correct, sir. Mr. Lantos, and if the lender, for instance, overappraised the property, then HUD accepted that? Mr. Adams, HUD was at risk for that. HUD was at risk at that amount, yes, sir, if they accepted the appraisal. Mr. Lantos, HUD didn't do any independent appraisal? Mr. Adams, that is correct, sir. Mr. Lantos, and what was the internal capability of HUD to evaluate the appraisals submitted by the lender? Mr. Adams, they gave them a post-endorsement. After the loan was insured, they went back to monitor it on occasion, and some of the monitoring reviews picked up on these exact same issues, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Lantos, did you at that time have any internal estimate of what was the average over-appraisal? Was it a minor sum? Was it 1, 2, 3 percent? Was it 10 percent? Mr. Adams, $36 million that we did on our first audit. And that 36, Mr. Lantos, and the 36 million over-appraisal related to how large a total mortgage. And then he says, that's an information we'll have to get for you. Then he says, staff tells me about 120 million in mortgages involved in that one. Mr. Lantos, on 120 million worth of mortgages, there was an over-appraisal of 36 million. The mortgages were 36 million above what they should have been? Mr. Adams, yes, sir. Mr. Lantos, and you, you reported that to whom? Mr. Adams, to the Assistant Secretary for Housing, sir. Mr. Lantos, and his response, who was that person? Mr. Adams, that was Acting Assistant Janet Hale. Mr. Lantos, Janet Hale. And, that, and what was that person's response? Mr. Adams, the response we ultimately received is the one that I referenced earlier, that our judgments were premature, unjustified, and unfair. And inasmuch as the lender had to assume part of the risk, and the program was new, and there were no foreclosures at that point to show the effect of what we were contending. Um, I don't want to read anymore. In retrospect, uh, Ms. Hale, was Mr. Adams right? In retrospect, Ms. Mr. Chairman, I think Mr. Adams clearly pointed out a problem. Um, Housing should have taken, management should have taken strong, effective action that was not taken. So here we have a case of, uh, of uh, the IG, the Inspector General, hoisting a flag of caution. He says we have, I'll, I'll let you come in on that in a minute. Hoisting a flag of caution saying, hey, this coinsurance program if it is done right, is a fine program, but it isn't being done right. It isn't being done right because the appraisals are overinflated, the projected incomes are overestimated, occupancy rates are uh, overestimated, and the thing is not going to work. You wanted to say something. M Mr. Uh, Adams pointed out early, and I understand repeatedly, although I was um, gone by sure. 1986. I do think when Mr. Adams brought his, I, ma might have been his first formal audit to housing, I believe Mr. Adams testified that he agreed with setting up the monitoring office that I have referred to and then that they would have to, that strong enforcement action should occur. And that's what I was referring to when we say that as the information continued to be gathered, there should have been strong action taken. Okay, just one more footnote. The most egregious case, well, I shouldn't say that because I always think I've found the most egregious case, then I found an even more egregious case. So as of today, the most egregious case I have found is a project called Colonial House. And I want to ask you a word about it, uh, Ms. Wiseman. Colonial House, it's a DRG project. Uh, on September 11, 1984, uh, the loan on Colonial House, which is an 1,818-unit project in Texas, 
The loan that is approved is 47.2 million. 47.2 million. It goes belly up and it is sold for 8.9 million. For 8.9 million. Now somebody at DRG sure had a mighty optimistic view of Colonial House and somebody at heart surely swallowed that mighty optimistic view because a 47.2 million dollar loan was insured and when the thing went sour HUD realized 8.9 million on that. Now you were not involved in this approval, Ms. Wiseman, but you happened to visit that project. Can you tell us about it? Yes, sir, I did, and I, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember if it was late 84 or early 85 that I visited the project at the insistence of uh, then a highly trained, qualified individual on the professional staff whose name is Conrad Egan. Uh, he asked me to uh, look at the project because he had grave concerns about uh, the underwriting on the project. I, I don't know for what function I was in Texas, and so I, I did go to the project with Conrad and uh, looked at it. We discussed the fact that he felt perhaps there had been inappropriate underwriting on the project. That's and obvious. Yes, sir. And he had grave concerns because it was virtually empty. It was uh, virtually empty. Yes, sir. And so uh, he, he was very concerned that the department was uh, hung out for a lot of liability. And that was one of the DRG projects. Yes, sir. Okay, Congressman Kyle. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd be happy to yield. Did Deborah, Deborah Gordine in any way discuss this project with you? No, sir. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You've, uh, you've followed the line of questioning that uh, Congressman Mar Martinez started, and I think I'd like to continue to pursue it because it really uh, points out a, a problem here. And I, know I want to understand this just a little bit better. Um, either of you uh, are qualified, I think, to answer my question, so either of you uh, please feel free to, uh, to answer these. What is the primary benefit that one of these lenders receives from uh, a co-insurance loan. Uh, perhaps, Mrs. Wiseman, you could just tell us that. What do they get out of it? Is it the fee? Is that the primary benefit? They get fees. They, uh, they're the approved yes. mortgagee. And uh, that's a lot of it. They get servicing. Servicing and fee. L l l let, me, let me preface the question with this. Any lender who makes a bad loan loses out <laughs> unless there's something to protect him correct? That, I'm not sure I You can't make that. money by, by making bad loans. No, sir. Right. Uh, these are bad loans. So there's something else that makes it profitable for the lender, right? Now, the first thing that would make it profitable is that you, you receive a fee for making the loan. And the second thing is you get uh, service fees for servicing the loan, right? Yes, sir. Uh, why is it to their advantage to inflate the value? Is that, does it uh, increase the amount of the fee? I, I can't honestly comment on that. I, the, the amount of the fee is based on the mortgage. Uh, I wouldn't think that would be a well, so, ma major significance. Well, if the mortgage is, is a third higher than it should be, then would the fee be, theoretically, a third higher than it otherwise should have been? It, it would be based on the mortgage amount. Mm -hmm. So whether it was the, the amount that should have been or the inflated fee, it would be increased by the amount that, that the appraisal was inflated. So the appraisal does have a relationship to the fee? The mortgage amount has a relationship to the fee, yes, yeah. sir. Yeah, okay. Um, Could I, oh, could I Mr. comment Chairman, here absolutely. Uh, work out a scenario for my friend from Arizona? Uh, assuming the desire to defraud, which was, I think, clearly apparent in many of these cases. If a house has an actual value of $100,000, 
and you have it appraised at $200,000 and 80% is insured by HUD, then in effect you have magically transformed the value of the house from 100000 to 160000 because you can walk away from that house and collect $160,000 from HUD. So inflating appraisals is a, is a most effective and singularly crooked way of making a lot of money. Yeah, uh, that uh, clearly had to be present in sig significant numbers of cases here, given the, the enormity of the overappraisal, given the, the, given the ratio between the loan and the ultimate liquidation price. I mean, in the case of Colonial House, we have a loan of 47.2 million and a sale price of 8.9 million. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I, I appreciate that. What I'm trying to understand is the is the advantage to the borrower versus the advantage to the lender. And and uh, clearly, if there is uh, either very sloppy appraising or fraud, the uh, the uh, money received by the borrower can be uh, used for whatever purpose, and it's not repaid, and uh, and that's a fraud on the government, uh, or or at least a significant abuse of the program. What I'm trying to get at here is the benefit that accrues to the lender, uh, not to the uh, to the borrower. And apparently, there are significant advantages for the lender as well. In this exactly. case, DRG, and th that that's what I'm trying to understand. Just exactly how can they use the process here to their advantage and and um, uh, to the uh, detriment of, of the taxpayer, so that we can try to devise ways of seeing that this doesn't occur. Well, let, let, please let me just. I, I'm, I've tried. I've yielded three times here, and I've yet to get to my questions. Buzz, if you just uh, g give me a chance here. Let me go back to, and and I'm trying to utilize the two of you as expert witnesses here on on this point, just to give me the benefit of, of your understanding. The the prim the primary problem here is one of risk, is it not? That is to say, these aren't borrowers who are going to the conventional market because the program, the projects are too risky. Isn't that the reason why these projects are funded by HUD, or excuse me, are are insured by HUD, co-insured? I, I no, I wouldn't think so. Why Why does HUD need to uh, to uh, co-insure these projects then? HUD's always been a. a financing mechanism for financing multifamily projects. The coinsurance lending process uh, was put in place because of drastic reductions in personnel. Actually, there was not adequate personnel, not adequate HUD staff to process the applications for, for multifamily projects. And this was in place so that it could be done by the private sector. So in other words, rather than direct loans by HUD? Not, no? not direct, insured loans that were processed by HUD. Risk sharing of the loan. I, I, I understand, right. but, but the basic question is still, why do you have to have these loans insured by the United States government in any event? Why doesn't the private market uh, do this? Why aren't these projects funded by the private market? There just isn't a private market to do it. Why isn't there? Well, I... I I don't have that answer. There just has not been a delivery system in the private sector ever that could uh, provide the multifamily financing vehicles that the department can. Well, but Mr. Kyle, your question yes. is is um, one of whether or not HUD should be multifamily should be the lender of last resort. I yes. think, and, and the way the statute is set up, I do not believe there's any criteria that mandates that that occur. Well, I guess, Mr. Chairman, uh, what I think we ought to get into here with uh, perhaps other people who can um, help us understand the origins of the program and so on, uh, it appears to me that the reason the government is involved here is because of, of risk. Uh, in the private sector, if there's a dollar to be made, somebody will make it. We know that. That's our system. And if there is a demand for loans that can be repaid, with the interest and therefore the profit going to the lender, those loans are going to be made by the private sector. There's plenty of capital out there if in Japan, if not in this country. So ordinarily, the project uh, could be funded in that way. There has to be a reason why we rely upon the government to provide the, the insurance. And I suspect that the reason is that there is an element of risk here. That's the way it is in the SBA loans and so on. We can, we can discuss that, uh, I, I guess, later. 
But what I was really trying to understand and what I think it would be helpful for us to perhaps call some other uh, witness before the body just to edify us more is how does the lender himself make money on this? How can we try to deal with that problem? Is it in the fees, the servicing, and so on? Do the appraisals uh, directly impact that? It appears that they do. Um, and that all then gets to the question of how HUD can regulate these appraisers anyway. Uh, if, unless you have something to add there, or Buzz, you do, I want to move on to another line like of questioning. 30 second interjection of education here, uh, just for uh, general purposes. The statement of Secretary Kemp was to the effect that DRG was itself responsible for $1.4 billion of coinsurance, defaulted on $500 million, and was the single largest coinsurer in HUD, which means they really dealt a death blow to the program. And on top of that, Ginny May, GNMA, had uh, discredited them or, or canceled their operations six months before HUD took action. I, I just find that additionally uh, ex <laughs> incredible to believe. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, I'd like to, uh, there are two other areas I'd like to get into. And uh, I, I think, um, Mrs. Wiseman, you're the one I should ask these questions of. Um, was, was DRG the only uh, uh, lender that was put on this uh, review status, or were there others as well, either before or after DRG, to your knowledge? I can't answer. Okay. I, I, I only know about DRG. Um, uh, Ms. Hale, are you aware of others that were put on this status? Not the kind, I am not aware of others being put on at that stage. The kind of review that DRG was put on there has been, my understanding, others that have had some kind of monitoring afterwards, but okay. not at that stage. I believe DRG at, at that time. Uh, we, we didn't really get into any specificity uh, as to what DRG had done wrong that caused them to be put on review, but the testimony is that they had done some things wrong. Can either of you just give me the nature of, of what these things were? What, what kind of practices were they pursuing that were wrong and therefore occasioned this review? Do, do either of you know what those were? But to the best of my recollection, the staff major concern was underwriting procedures, and that would include appraising and underwriting guidelines for for the bars. In other and words, that's all I you know. Okay, generally not being careful enough to uh, make sure that the that the project would make financial sense, either because the occupancy would be low, the person wouldn't repay the loan, uh, the appraisal was too high, those kinds of things. Is that yes, correct? Yes, underwriting guidelines, though, including all those things, yes. Okay, Mr. Chairman, well, did you I, want to I just, I just would like to suggest, and I thank my friend from Arizona for yielding, that that's a very generous interpretation, that they weren't careful enough, a less charitable interpretation would be that they deliberately undertook to overinflate, overappraise, uh, estimate occupancy rates and income uh, so that they could gain uh, uh, financial benefits uh, in an inappropriate and, as it appears, in an illegal fashion. So okay. it's not just, it, it, it conceivably may be carelessness but I think it is very likely not to be carelessness. It was the largest operation. It was put on notice by HUD for violations of HUD rules and regulations. And after that happened, and after um, uh, Secretary Hills tried with Ms. Wiseman unsuccessfully to have preclearance lifted, succeeded in getting preclearance lifted with Secretary Pierce, this thing just escalated, and um, uh, there are, uh, according to HUD, um, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars of taxpayers' losses, which you and I will pay for because of DRG's activities. So carelessness, while it may have been part of it, is, is only probably a very small part of it. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I wasn't trying to put words in the witness's mouth. I don't know what happened, and I don't know how to characterize it. That's what I was asking them. If, if my characterization is incorrect, I'd like to have either of you correct me. I'm certainly not an apologist for DRG. I don't know what they did. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, unless we have evidence that they intentionally defrauded the, uh, the, the government, I don't know that I want to make that kind of a charge. Um, do either of you... I, Please characterize in your own words as best you can what you believe the nature of the wrong conduct was that occasioned the uh, review status that they were put on. 
to the best of my ability to remember, uh, the staff brought to my attention uh, the concerns they had about underwriting procedures being performed by DRG. And this, this would include appraising and processing and, and the type of documentation required to insure a loan. Was it more than just lack of documentation and, and uh, technical form filling out kinds of problems? It, it was under clearly all facets of underwriting that were brought to my attention as far as appraisals, underwriting guidelines as far as a credit worthiness and, and occupancy and all of the all the things being considered in underwriting. So it's, it's and that's that's basically all that I can recollect. But it goes to, to judgment factor at a minimum, it goes to judgment factors, not just form filling out legal technicalities in the way that they were complying with HUD regulations to submit forms to you and so on. I, I don't believe it had anything to do with forms. I think the professionals that were uh, viewing the program from a professional career status uh, felt that underwriting guidelines uh, were not being appropriately handled. Okay. That's and what they brought to my attention. And this could either be uh, stupidity, uh, carelessness, uh, or intentional uh, fraud, as, as the chairman suggests may have been the case. Sir, I, I don't know what they had in mind, but I do know that they were concerned. Okay. You, you don't know which of the three or when, what I, combination? I, I don't know if they had in mind that it was fraud or if they had in mind that it was just pure uh, poor underwriting okay. uh, totally. Okay. Um, let me get to the meeting uh, that you had with Mrs. Hills. Um, you said there were DRG officials, Mrs. Hills, uh, Secretary Hills, uh, and a number of your professional staff in attendance at this meeting. Is that correct? Yes. Um, in late 84 or uh, uh, the spring of 85. Um, Mrs. Hills, you said, uh, pled the case for her uh, client. Um, just characterize, if you would, the nature of that uh, meeting. Was that, uh, uh, did, did, did uh, you get the impression that former Secretary Hills uh, was trying to um, uh, peddle her influence or throw her weight around uh, politically or that she was pleading the case on be, uh, as an attorney? I, I got the idea that she was there as their attorney and uh, was representing them well making the best case she could, but ultimately it didn't persuade you or your staff? Uh, no, it did not. Now, um, later, uh, the, the chairman asked you, uh, he said later the case was taken to uh, Secretary Pierce. You testified that you were not involved in, in that. Do, do, w were either of you involved in, uh, in the subsequent effort uh, by Mrs. Hill with Secretary Pierce? No? No. Okay. No. Uh, do either of you know anything about a meeting that she later had with Secretary Pierce? I was told by the professional staff that, that Secretary Hills was arranging a meeting with Secretary Pierce. Uh, were you still on the job at that time? At, at the time that I was told that Secretary Hills was arranging a meeting with Secretary Pierce, yes, I was on staff. I, I don't know when the meeting was, so I, I can't testify if I was on staff at the time it occurred. Okay, so then I gather you don't know the result, or you weren't told what happened in the meeting then either. Is that correct? Uh, I, I did not attend the meeting, so I would, no, I don't know the substance. I was not there. All right. Uh, um, Ms. Hale, were you on board at that time? Do you know? I, I don't, I have no knowledge of the meeting. So I okay, so neither of you then have, have actual knowledge of the meeting. Um, the, the reason I wanted to get to this, Mr. Chairman, this, this is just a, a, a matter in, or a manner in which you characterize it, I suppose, but I, I want to be careful about this particular point. Um, your, your question was something to the effect that uh, presumably that meeting was to have uh, uh, your ruling, Mrs. Wiseman's ruling, uh, overruled. Would that be a, a fair uh, statement? And you said yes, I think that would be a fair statement. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about the characterization of that meeting if, in fact, um, you don't know what the result of the meeting was or what was said in that meeting. And, and let me ask it to you this way. Um, the meeting could have been for the purpose of asking that your particular ruling be overruled. It could also be to present a different case, different evidence, different facts, to ask for different relief. Isn't that correct? 
it, it could have been any of those things. I was just informed by the career staff after we had made the decision that uh, Mrs. Hills had decided to uh, take the case uh, to a higher authority to the secretary. And uh, certainly it's presumption on my part that it was to, uh, uh, to get DRG reinstated. I was just told by the staff that. Well, the reason I, I ask it is that apparently, and that's the next thing I'll get into here, <clears throat> what occurred was that the kind of um, uh, status, as the chairman said, was changed somewhat to some kind of a post-review uh, rather than a pre-review. Um, is, is that the understanding that either of you have? Uh, my understanding, they were reinstated with some constraints, and that's all, that's all the knowledge all you that know. I have. Mrs. Hale, do you have any other uh, I have no knowledge. knowledge of it? Okay, well, we can certainly obtain that information from other witnesses. Um, Just as a, a, a matter of edification, I think, Ms. Hale, you talked about a post-review uh, process. Um, what happens on that? Does, is the loan contingent? And if uh, HUD officials find that there was some problem in the granting of the loan, do they then notify the lender that, in fact, this loan cannot go forward with HUD coinsurance and therefore the loan is canceled? Mr. Carl, I like Ms. Wiseman was not a multifamily expert. I am now testifying based on my knowledge of a program. I haven't read the regs or the handbooks in a long time. It's my understanding, and if I'm incorrect, Shirley, please correct me, that the, this was a post-endorsement process and review, which then meant that the federal government, unless they found fraud, was um, liable for the losses. That's my understanding of the program. Un un unless they found fraud, meaning that um, shortly after a loan is made and the paperwork is, is uh, received by HUD, HUD takes a look at it and if HUD says, wait a minute, this looks fraudulent to us and then, con okay. and then confirms that in their view that that's the case, then they can notify the lender that this loan is not going to be co-insured by HUD. Is that correct? Is that generally how it works? I, I think that the co-insurer has the authority to close the loan unless there is fraud and have it insured to uh, the best of my recollection. Does, does HUD, though, make some kind of post-determination before the loan is closed and, and final and the government is on the hook? I don't, don't know exactly so. how that process I don't works. Think so. I don't think so, but I, I, I'm not sure. Okay, again, that's something we can find out from, uh, from others then. Mr. Chairman, that's all I have. Thank you very much, Congressman Carl. Congressman Shays. The um, questions that we're asking you about uh, Secretary Hill are very important, obviously. Um, she is a cabinet member and will be appearing before this committee. And, and while I'm sure that she would, you know, uh, as would almost anyone else, just as soon not be, uh, coming before this committee, I know th that she welcomes the opportunity to set the record straight, as, as some stories have appeared in the newspaper. But it's very important for us to be clear as to your both relationship with her, uh, since she is a focus of attention, at least uh, as far as it is on, on Monday, and to, to, to get all of that out now rather than have her come in and that and have to in invite you all back later. So uh, one of the things I'm going to request from you, if, if there's some involvement with um, Secretary Hill that you are involved in, uh, and we don't ask a question, because obviously uh, if we don't ask a question, you, you may not decide to volunteer. And I'm, I'm going to basically uh, ask you if you've had any meetings with uh, Secretary Hill other than the one you had, Ms. Weissman, and I'd like to ask you uh, if you had any meetings with uh, or attended any meetings where she, she was present. Congressman, I have been asked this question before. It is my recollection that Ms. Wiseman asked me to attend that meeting with Secretary Hills and Secretary Pierce. Um, I had not done the staff preparation for it, but I believe I was in attendance at that meeting. That, through my tenure at HUD, was the only time I had met Mrs. Hills. 
And Ms. Weissman, that's the only time you had a meeting with the Secretary? When, when I met with her and the uh, officials of DRG, yes, sir. Now, were both of you aware of her status uh, as a former Secretary of HUD? I mean, is that something that just was, you weren't aware of, or were you, were you aware of it? No, we were aware of it. I was aware of it. I was, too. She has a tremendous reputation for how she managed that department. Right. Uh, there were definitely smiles on your face. I mean, the fact is that when uh, you've made a decision with Ms. Weissman that uh, you got your career employees have big problems with DRG, and, uh, and, and you have this box behind your desk. Yes, sir. Was that in the box behind your desk? Uh, no. It really it came there, yes. But uh, was it staying there for a while? I mean, did you? No, but Secretary Hills, in her capacity as their uh, attorney rep representing DRG, asked for a meeting. Uh, whenever the time frame permitted, she came in with those people. We had the meeting, and uh, we didn't delay. Secretary Hills is a very uh, fine, capable person. But because she was Secretary Hills, we didn't see that it was uh, important enough to, to reinstate DRG, if that's the question you're asking. No, I just, I, and I think you've answered, and I think it's to her favor. Uh, your point is that, that uh, DRG had an attorney, it was Secretary Hill, who you clearly knew was a very distinguished, um, uh, had been a very distinguished Secretary of HUD, and she was representing them, and, and she asked you for this meeting? Uh, her law firm or she uh, sent a letter in requesting the meeting is. And uh, I got the inference from your comments that if this had been anyone else, you would have also honored uh, the request of DRG to sit down and talk with you. Absolutely. And this meeting was not an unusual meeting. Oh, no. We, we always met with anyone who requested an audience to, to have their problems and concerns aired. Now, um, at the meeting, the secretary was not in attendance. At, at this meeting that you had, Secretary Hills was there. Yes, oh, no, sir. This, the, the secretary, Secretary Pierce. Oh no, sir. Secretary Pierce was not there. Um, your professional staff after this meeting, in, you and your professional staff after the meeting, uh, felt just as strongly that uh, the pre-clearance should not be removed. Is that not correct? That's correct. Now. Um, my colleague, Mr. Kyle, has, has asked these questions, but let me just be, be clear on them because you had spoken earlier about it. Uh, when you talked about a, a, the higher authority, that she presented her case to you and, and then DRG uh, and her, their attorney, um, Secretary Hill, uh, went to a higher authority. The, the only higher authority clearly would have been the secretary. I mean, you were, you were next in line. Was there, were there authorities in between that she could have gone up to? Not in, well, I guess she could have gone to the under, but not. Could have gone to the under secretary. Yes, sir. Yes. But in, in normal procedures, if, if the assistant secretary or the acting assistant secretary um, doesn't uh, concur with the request, then the next step would be the secretary. It, 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 it's a level where it would be the deputy assistant secretary first, then the assistant secretary, and then the secretary. Now, one of the disadvantages you clearly have is that you were involved in this decision and you had career people involved in this decision, and you know it went to a higher authority, and you know ultimately it went to Secretary Pierce. And while you weren't in that meeting, which I think is somewhat extraordinary, it would seem to me that if she's to present a case, that the secretary, uh, now I, I'm talking secretary, secretary. When I refer to the secretary, I'm referring to Secretary Pierce. Okay. When, when Secretary Pierce had this meeting, it would seem to me that he would have said, okay, in, in this circumstance, I don't know if, how to characterize his decision to meet with uh, DRG. I'm not sure if I'm comfortable with his decision to meet. Um, I don't know if this is what he did common, this common practice or what. So I'm, I have to think that one over. But it does seem logical to me that if he was going to have a meeting with DRG to learn the story, that he would want the career people to sit there and you in particular as the person in charge. Did he invite you to this meeting? No. Did he tell you first that there was going to be a meeting? Let me start from there. No, sir. 
he did not invite you to the meeting. After the meeting, when a decision, whether it, whatever motivated, new information or just, you know, forget how well DRG presented their case. They may have presented it well or not. We don't know. But the fact is, ultimately, you were overturned and DRG was reinstated with some restrictions. So we know the result. We don't know what motivated the secretary. But that's correct, is it not, that it, they were reinstated with I, some restrictions? I was not there. I don't know. I know, it. I know you weren't there. Okay. I, I, I can't honestly tell you that there wasn't somebody from multifamily or that there wasn't someone from my staff. There perhaps could have... Uh, let me interrupt you here a second. Did anyone, I, your testimony is, is very clear. You weren't there, so you can't say who was at the meeting. Right. Did anyone in your staff say that they were at that meeting? Not. Did any of your staff tell you about this meeting? Yes. Some people told me there was going to be a meeting, some people on my staff. Who were those people? I, I, I some people from multifamily that, that would have normally kept me informed about what was happening. What was your reaction when you heard there was going to be a meeting and she was going to see the secretary? Did you, were you inclined to call the secretary and say, I'd like to let you know what's going on? I mean, I, what was your reaction? I don't remember. Okay. Um, how did you find that something had resulted? Let me ask you this. Did you know when the meeting was going to be or did you hear about it after? I was told at some point in time after our meeting and our decision that we felt that nothing had changed at DRG, I was told by some career professional staff, and I can't remember who it was exactly, uh, that there was going to be a meeting that after our determination had been delivered to uh, Secretary Hills, that they had made the determination to appeal it to a higher authority. And I just don't remember what happened because it was in the process of the time that I was leaving. I guess I'm a little, every time you say higher authority, the only higher authority that there really was yes, was Secretary. A absolutely, and I, uh, yes. And so it, it wasn't the higher authority. They were gonna go to Secretary. Yes, sir. You heard, they ha you had a meeting, your staff said no, you concurred with your career professionals. Yes, sir. Uh, you were, clear as to how you, f you felt about it. This should not go forward. And, and uh, you did your job. You met with DRG and their attorney, and you said no. You heard they were going to go to a higher authority, uh, which was the secretary. Now, weren't you curious to know uh, what was going to happen this meeting and the result? I mean, you're a tough lady. I mean, you are. Uh, and and, and uh, you have a lot of guts. And, and um, uh, you're not willing to say to someone, including even this committee, that we're wrong when we're wrong. Uh, weren't you curious to know what happened? Well, to be quite candid about it, when I was informed by the career staff, I guess I just assumed that either I or some member of my staff would be invited. And not knowing when the meeting occurred, I don't know if perhaps uh, Ms. Hale, who was next in line, uh, Silvio de Bartolome, who was the DAS for multifamily, or... Um, this is helpful for me to know who those people are. So if it wasn't you, it might have been Miss Hale, and we know that it wasn't because you didn't... The, meet. the line of authority was uh, Miss Hale. If, it were not, if I were not invited, and that's a good possibility, I wouldn't be. Uh, well, I, I, yeah. But uh, <laughs> Miss Hale might be. Uh, next in line would have been Silvio de Bartolome. <coughs> next in line would have... Uh, James Nistler. Now, was he a career person, James Nistler? No, he's the. Uh, those were all political appointees. Uh, Janet, Miss Hale, it was the deputy assistant secretary for policy and budget. Silvio de Bartolome was the deputy assistant secretary for multifamily, which is the next in line, and James Nistler was the deputy assistant secretary for single family, which is the last in line. Who would have been the chief career individual who was not high on this project? Uh, and, and was there one individual, one career person that, that would be someone we obviously should contact, not whether we call them before the committee, but just find out if they were ever invited to this meeting or ever got any feedback about the meeting? Uh, 
The only person that comes to my mind in multifamily, uh, and that was multifamily development, so I don't think that was coinsurance, is James Hammernick. Okay, let me just remake this request. If you think of some of the career people that were involved in this decision with you that you concurred with, I, I think it would be helpful for the committee to know. I'll be glad to go back and see if I can figure out who was what. Now, the meeting is held. You weren't obviously invited. How did you find out about what happened in the meeting? Did you find out or had you left by then? I, I don't think I found out while I was there. It, it doesn't come to mind. I had nothing, uh, no conversations with anyone that refreshes my memory that it happened perhaps even while I was there or that the decision was made. I just don't remember. I, I know the way I operate, and if I'm going to overrule someone and someone's going to come see me, um, I might have that person see me privately, but ultimately I'm going to have the different parties in the room together. I'm certainly going to come back and consult. I mean, at the very least, it would strike me that the secretary would have called you on the phone or said, I've got to talk to you about this. I think you're all wet about what you've done. I just want you to know I'm going to overrule you. Um, and clearly this is so significant because we're talking about uh, eventually a half a billion dollars uh, with one company uh, with these failings, these foreclosures, a half a billion dollars. So this is not an unimportant meeting and this was not an unimportant decision that the secretary made. And I would be very proud if I were you to know that I didn't cave in, that I stuck with my facts and in spite of the fact that there were distinguished people that felt I was wrong, that I kept to that. And I, I have nothing but admiration for you. Um, I'd like to um, just uh, pursue this a bit more uh, with you, Ms. Hale. Um, I know you're new. You're taking over at a dicey time, and I remember that Tom Demery came over and he was asked to sign off on some projects and so on, but I'm a little confused with the reference you weren't multifamily and so on. You were, the, the, there was an audit of, um, there was an intern, internal audit of the Section 223F coinsurance program, the coinsurance program. And it was not a insignificant document. It uh, goes about 30, Three pages, and there's a summary in it, and it's and and it's addressed to you. And I, and in fairness to you, I want to I want to get, get the time perspective how long you were there. But it was debate, dated November 5th, 1985. By the way, excuse me. When was the meeting that you had again with uh, uh, the the secretary um, Hill? I I don't know. I don't, I, I, it was either my, late 84 or early 85 because I. Marie Sparksdale, the assistant secretary, left uh, permanently in, I thought it was December, but I, it was brought to my attention. It was January 85. I left in May, uh, mid-May of 85. The only thing that if it were 84, latter part of 84, it could have been if Mr. Barksdale were on travel. I tend to believe it was in um, 1985. Yeah, we'll, we'll obviously know exactly when that was, but... Um, you resigned in May of 85, and, and so, um, Ms. Hale, you, you took over in May of 85, correct? As, yes. As acting. Mm -hmm. By October, excuse me, by November, you had been there a, a, a bit of time. I mean, so you had to have felt somewhat comfortable at, uh, with your job, and, and you were, I would think, pretty much up to speed. So there was more time than I thought. You were given this report uh, dated November 5th, 1985, and, and you're, you're aware of this report. I haven't actually seen the report, but I've, subsequent to getting prepared for this hearing, but I had it obviously at the time I was Assistant Secretary. This would be very helpful for me. It's addressed to you. Yes, sir. And, and it's a major audit, and, and it disclosed major problems with coinsurance. I have not and asked the staff before my appearance here for a copy of the audit. I have not, in preparation for this hearing, had, the, had an opportunity to review it. I'll be more okay, than happy me, no, to. Let me just say this to you, and this is not really a criticism mm -hmm. of you, because I'm thinking as a congressman, I get sent a lot of things. Um, I know I didn't get sent this audit. I wasn't in office sure. at the time. 
and we don't usually get the, off, the audits as congressmen when we get the, the reviews, the summaries. But we're trying to, this is, it may seem like a parenthetical, but we, we, we know the, that the auditors have done some good work. I've had some criticism with Mod Rehab, but they've done some very good work, and, and, and that's fairly clear in, uh, in terms of, of, my, of my feelings about it. But this was addressed to you. I mean, you are the person, are you not, that ultimately has to deal with co-insurance, or am I talking to the wrong person? You, as oh, acting I'm assistant secretary, I was responsible for all the insurance, all of the housing programs. Does any, I'd be more than happy to continue the line of conversation. I'd just like to have a copy of the report, if that's yeah, possible, yeah, sir. Well, I, I'm, yeah, I don't know what you'd do with it if I gave it to you, because you're not going to read it now. But, okay. I mean, uh, I, I, do we have another copy of this report? I mean, the, the, what, the, the point I'm trying to make to you is, one, I want to know if you got the report. Two, I want to know if you read it. And if, you, if by, by giving it to you, that would refresh you as to whether you read it or not, that would be helpful. Whatever your answer is, it's going to be significant to me, and then I'll just pursue my questions that way. Are, are you not aware that you've seen this report? Do you? During my tenure as the acting assistant secretary, I'm sure that I saw the report or was actively briefed on it. So you think it's likely that you got the report and that you were briefed on it? I'm not going to ask you specific points in the report, so that's not my purpose of asking the question. I'm not going to quiz you on the report. I want to know if you got the report your answer is, to the best of your knowledge, you did. I want to ask you if you read the report. Do you know if you read the report? Um, I, to the best of my recollection, I probably did. I, I don't remember. To the best I'm of your saying. knowledge, were you ever briefed on this report, whether you read it or not? I mean, there are reports we get I don't read. I get briefed on them, and I'm satisfied. It may be I, was, I, I was probably briefed on the report or its findings or what action would, would occur. Who on your staff would have briefed you on this report? If I was briefed, and again, I have, I, I just were. don't have any memory of this. Do you, do you understand Multi the significance of why I'm asking this question? Do I, would it help you to, for me to put this in a framework? It certainly would. I'd be more than happy to answer let me, about co-insurance Let me co put it in, in a framework. You're in charge. Mm -hmm. You're the person who's responsible for co-insurance. We have an audit report <laughs> where tremendous man hours were spent and it's a pretty devastating report about big problems with the coinsurance program. Ultimately, we are looking at hundreds of millions of dollars because not of just DRG, but of, of the failure of, of HUD to resp uh, respond to this report. And then we get a statement from Mr. Adams. He says, the response we ultimately received is the one that I referred earlier, that our judgments were premature unjustified and unfair inasmuch as the lender had to assume part of the risk and the program was new and there was no foreclosure at the point to show the effect of what we were contending. This actually relates um, more directly, I think, with the, um, the specific mortgage of DRG. But the bottom line to all this is that I've been critical of, of the um, Inspector General, acknowledging that he should have been more aggressive, people in HUD should have done a better job, and we in Congress should have done a better job. I'm responsible as well as a member of Congress, so the shit lame to go around, but, but it's highly significant that this would not be a report that would come right out to your mind. It's a major program, and there are hundreds of millions of dollars involved. That's why I'm asking the question. And so... Um, do you think it would be helpful to you for me just to show it? I, I, let me just give you an example of, of the, the, the summary, even if, even if you didn't read the whole report. Do you want to make a comment or do you want me to? No, sir, go ahead. Uh, just in the summary, it said, however, we disclosed that some lender underwriting practices did not fully comply with HUD program regulations, and HUD monitoring was not always adequate to protect HUD interests in such instances. And then it said, just to give an idea of the magnitude of this, it said, property values and project net income estimated by lenders consistently, they had looked at nine projects. 
consistently exceeded supportable market values estimated by our appraiser. That's consistent. As a result, for eight of the projects reviewed, the co-insured loan amounts exceeded the maximum amount based on our estimate by 35.96 million. That's just with those few projects. Overestimated property values allowed lenders to, one, underwrite loans at 70% of, of value and avoid cost certification requirements. That's an astounding thing to avoid, isn't it? To, to not have your, your costs, uh, to not have to certify your costs. Then it says, and two, maximize loan amounts to meet sponsor requests. To support the values and provide adequate debt service, estimated net income was also inflated by using inappropriate comparisons, increased trend rates and trending rents 12 to 18 months beyond endorsement dates. It goes on. Um, at the bottom of just the summary, it says, we recommend that HUD and lender procedures be revised to ensure the timely completion of repairs. So it's pretty significant. It's just on one page. It's, it's your job, your responsibility. What did you do about it? I took that responsibility seriously. As I recall from having read the Inspector General's testimony, when he was in front of this committee, he said that we both agreed to establish the monitoring office, that we needed to take strong monitoring steps, and then, since there had not been defaults at the time, that report, that we would take strong enforcement action if abuses were found. Is this program and, and this whole, and their audit, um, I realize it's 85, and that is a long time. And I, I mean that sincerely. Um, but did you have dialogue, significant dialogue, with the, with the Inspector General or his people about coinsurance? I don't remember personally having significant dialogue with the Inspector General or his people. No, as, or his people. Or his people. I, again, having been, come from a background of budget, much more than managing coinsurance, but having some very capable career people, I know that there was extensive conversation between the career, or would assume that there would be correct, uh, extensive conversation, because then we developed the response back to the IG, agreeing with some of their findings, disagreeing with some of their findings, and indicating to the IG what outstanding action, what actions we would take as housing, what action housing would take, excuse me. See, my, my reading of the, of the Inspector General's uh, feelings about this was that nobody was listening. And that when he went to HUD, that HUD said, you know, we're taking care of this, don't worry about it. Um, we're doing it, and uh, so he kind of backed off and then revisited it in 88 and found that we had significant problems with it. Maybe it just, and maybe, uh, Ms. Weissman, I could just close by asking both of you this. Um, Coinsurance is, is, a, is a program that I'm just beginning to understand. Is it conceivable that people in your position uh, with lots of different concerns just didn't have the expertise to deal with this? I mean, I'm just really trying to have a, I, you, you made you, your comment, you kind of alluded to the fact that you were more interested in budgeting than this. I mean, is there, is there a, a fatal flaw in this process? And I find myself asking this where the right people aren't getting the reports. So let me ask you, Ms. Ms. Weissman, if you were still there, would you have been the right person to get this report? Uh, as the acting assistant secretary? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, Ms. Hale, would that be your, your you, so yes. you fully agree that this report should have been sent to you? Yes. Okay, and that, that you ultimately should be held accountable for what you did with this report or didn't do? Yes. And, and frankly, I'm not going to get into that. I just want to be sure that that it went to the right people. Um, and so, Mr. Chairman, I'm finished. Thank you. I will only have one question to ask of each of you, but before I do, uh, uh, and let me ask my colleague if he has any questions. No, you. Uh, uh, you asked uh, Ms. Wiseman to give you a chance to comment on Title 10. You are justifiably proud of your concern for affordable housing. I think you have been quoted in some places as, uh, as being responsible for 
Title 10 being used for luxury housing, and you wanted to correct that impression. So I'd like to give you that, imp that opportunity. Mr. Chairman, I, I very much appreciate this because I have, for 25 years, been a great proponent of affordable housing. This year, I have chosen as my theme, where will our children live, to try to address housing affordability across this country. I have been quoted as being uh, a consultant who made money out of the housing programs at the expense of the poor. I can tell you that that is totally untrue. I have been an advocate of affordable housing, and in the IG report in 1983, before it was ever sent forward, I sent a letter to then the Undersecretary Don Hovde explaining my position about the regs that were promulgated by uh, the statute which enabled Title X. In those regs, there had been some abuses and there had been some luxury housing and there had been projects back in the 70s that had ensured some projects that were contiguous to golf courses. In that letter, I told then Under Secretary Hovde that I would make sure that that was changed. And I can tell you that the guidelines that were referred to erroneously and falsely relating to me saying that I was a proponent of luxury housing is totally, totally wrong. They're referring to the IG's report as contained in the handbook 4800.1 RV-1, which I approved for publication in the fall of 83. Number one, explicitly on the first page, it says, and I approved this handbook and signed off on it, the developer will be encouraged to include a proper balance for families of low or moderate income. The program may not be used to assist the development of recreational or resort communities or exclusive subdivisions of luxury housing. We go on to outline and determine that we must uh, support 20% of the units made affordable for families between 80% and 100% of median income, or 35% of units affordable by families between 100% and 130% of median income, or 50% of the units must be finance financeable under the FHA. I have, I have across this country traveled for affordable housing, and I don't want anybody to think that I'm not a supporter 110% of affordable housing and have been for 25 years. And I really appreciate the opportunity to make that statement. Well, we appreciate the opportunity of hearing from you. I will ask uh, a, a question of each of you. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, my colleague will have some questions. But before I ask my final question, um, Ms. Wiseman, is there anything you would like to share with the subcommittee on any of the subjects that are relevant to our HUD inquiry? I, I am very concerned that housing programs uh, should not be scrapped, that they should be changed and cleaned up and scrutinized, and, and the home builders of this country and developers that I am associated will be happy to work with Secretary Kemp in his efforts to clean up the department in any way that we can assist. But I would certainly hate to see the demise of programs that could be salvaged uh, that affect not only the poor, but the middle income people in this country that Congress in their wisdom has chosen to place on the books that I know that can be regulated properly if, if we have the proper oversight. Well, the subcommittee certainly agrees with you. Is there anything, Ms. Hale, that you would like to share with the subcommittee? Mr. Chairman, I don't think I can say it better than Shirley just did, that I think that careful review by this committee, by Secretary Kemp, will only be strengthen the ability to provide low-income housing to those that need it and appropriate ho housing for first-time homebuyers. So I congratulate this committee and, sir, how you personally handle it. Thank, thank you very much. My, my final question to... to both of you is the same. Um, and this may not be so easy to answer, but the purpose is not to give you a difficult question, but to assist the committee in, in its work. In retrospect, uh, how do you evaluate 
Secretary Pierce's judgment in putting Ms. Dean in such a pivotal position that she obviously occupied. Uh, did she, by experience, training, judgment, uh, have the qualifications to carry out such an enormously complex range of responsibilities in one of our government's most important agencies um, all over the country involving tens of billions of dollars. Ms. Wiseman, would you care to comment? Mr. Chairman, that's a difficult question. I, I must preface my remarks with the fact that I believe young people in this country deserve an opportunity to participate at all levels and to have access to responsibility and, uh, and decision making. However, I, coming from 25 years experience, I, I would say that a position as powerful as the executive assistant to the Secretary of Housing needs a person with lots of experience, um, lots of time and grade, if you will. And I, I guess the Secretary uh, misjudged Ms. Dean's experience in, in that manner. Ms. Hale? Mr. Chairman, that's a very difficult question for me. As Shirley alluded to, I was a young person that was given the opportunity to progress. I think the responsibilities of the Office of the Executive Assistant to the Secretary, that office having the ability to influence, if not control, actions um, that are undertaken at the department. You've alluded to the quarter of a trillion dollars worth of long-term housing assistance that is there, the FHA insurance programs. You would hope that the person that is put into that job has the wisdom, the experience, or the maturity to handle that. I think your question, sir, was how did we judge Secretary Pierce's judgment? And I honestly think that's one for him to answer. Um, all of us would have done that job differently, I think. But it's a, um, it's a task that I, judging another person's character and decisions are difficult for me. Well, the chair certainly won't force you to answer these questions because I, really, I realize they're awkward, but I asked Secretary Kemp to give us his judgment of Secretary Pierce's stewardship of that important office for eight years. Now I would like to ask each of you to comment on that stewardship. Ms. Wiseman. Hindsight's always twenty twenty, And uh, looking back, I, I'm sure that the secretary would have done things differently. I, uh, I certainly know that, that uh, there were things that happened that I, I know that he must be very, very concerned about. Um, I guess how he's judged will, history will tell, and I, uh, I, I just, I, I don't know how to judge uh, what's happened because there's still revelations that are unfolding, and I, uh, I find it extremely difficult to comment. Yeah, you know, we are not standing in judgment of, of, our, of our fellow human being. We are talking about a public official performing a public job. Yes, sir. And, uh, you know, members of Congress are judged every two years yes, at sir. the ballot box. So it's not such an unusual thing. Ms. Hale. I've had the opportunity to serve under several cabinet secretaries. Um, Secretary Pierce's management style, I think, was one of delegation in, in many areas. Um, I personally preferred the hands-on, the, the ability to work with a cabinet secretary that was very actively involved in the policies and the practices of that department. So from that perspective, I would say that if I had a choice of management style, how I would either do it or how I would like to work for somebody, I certainly prefer the latter and um, would think that it would, might be a more appropriate way to, uh, to manage that department. Congressman Shays. 
Ms. Hill, I, I really feel I need to come well, back. Well, before Congressman Chase begins, I, I just uh, I'm, I regret to inform my colleague that the chair will need to catch a train, so we will have to bring this hearing to a close uh, with the Congressman Shea's uh, question, because otherwise the train will be gone. I guess I missed my train, huh, Mr. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On this occasion. The only time. <laughs> Ms. Hale, I, I need to ask you um, uh, this, this question, uh, because I'm very uneasy about your response. I asked you if you had seen this report of November 5th, and you said, well, I, you know, I haven't seen it, I don't have a copy. Uh, I have to believe this was an important document, and you knew that there was a major audit of coinsurance. Uh, and, and I just want to be very clear on this. You knew there was a report, and you knew you had a report. Is that not true? I, I hope, and going back and looking at the record, what I meant to say if I did not clearly, in preparation for this hearing, I have not had a chance to review. Maybe it would be a more it's succinct got, way to say yeah. it, so that whether I actually read it then, or wh I know I got it, I just was uncomfortable the way you asked the question about this report having not had a chance to look at it again. No. I was familiar with the report. I was familiar with the Inspector General's concerns. And I hope I took appropriate action of establishing the monitoring action, I, I, I could monitoring under, office. I could understand if uh, uh, wanting the, the the report in your hands if I was going to ask you a detailed question about it, which I have no intention of. But, but I have to just read you the end of the report because it's so obvious that you had this report. And it's, and it's even important, I think, to say that this report wasn't dumped on your desk November 5th because it says, in response to the draft audit report, there's a draft audit report, the Office of Housing agreed, and that's your office, that closer money will be instituted in each of the areas discussed in the recommendations one through four in addition, further guidance and monitoring will be initiated to assure monitoring reviews are properly conducted and documented. Uh, the point is, there's even a draft report that you go over. Is that not true? Congressman Shays, I, I somehow have a sense we got off on the wrong foot in this line of questioning when I reacted or responded as I did to not having seen the report in preparation for the hearing. As I said, I am familiar with the report, the draft report. There was also a draft report. Is that That would true? be the normal procedure of the department. So there was dialogue back and forth. Correct. Now, are, are you the individual uh, that said there will be closer monitoring will be instituted in each of the areas discussed? I mean, what did you, was that? Under your, my auspices as the acting general deputy or at probably general deputy by the time that was signed, um, I would have been ultimately responsible. Okay. I'm, I'm just grateful to have this clarification. The bottom line is you were given a draft report. You went over the draft report with the IG's office you ultimately were given the final report in November and you had no lack of knowledge that they had big problems with this program and they expected certain actions. I knew the Inspector General was very concerned about it, had found problems, that housing had said that we would take follow-up action. The report, I think, was issued in November of 85. I left in February of 86. So I took the action trying to set up the office That's as I That's very important. The, the point that I also need to know is that you got this report at the end of 85, but you basically weren't there to initiate a lot of these recommendations or follow through. I worked very carefully, sir, to try and establish the office. Again, I have not gone back to see what day it was actually established, but that was an important principle to me to be sure that we had a monitoring office in place. I have total understanding that if you weren't there for the next year or two to implement it, that uh, we can't hang all of this on your shoulder, and I'm, I'm happy to have that clarified. Just one last question. Do you need to Please. leave? Do I no, have two I'm more fine. minutes? Sure. Uh, you made a, a statement that Deborah Dean had extraordinary powers in certain areas. Could you define where those certain areas, you thought her, her powers were more involved, was it with mod rehab, was it, you know, what did you mean by that? I guess it would be easier to talk about the areas that I don't think she was as involved with. Um, not as involved? Not, not as involved. I think Just the, one or two and then we'll call it quits. I think the budget process, the negotiations with, at least during my tenure, the negotiations with OMB or contact with the appropriations committees, those areas that, that others of us in the department handle. So what I really hear you saying, it was easier for you to tell us where she didn't have authority than it was to tell you where she had authority. I can tell you that... It's consistent with what we have heard that she had a lot of power, except, as you point out, in a few areas. Am I putting words in your mouth? No, I, I can talk about the areas where she did not exercise a lot of interaction in areas that I was personally involved with. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
Well, I would very much like to thank both of you. You have been most helpful to the subcommittee, and I want to wish you very well as chairman of uh, this very important organization, National Association of Home Builders. I want to wish you the best of luck at the Office of Management and Budget. This hearing is concluded. Join us Sunday morning at 12.25 a.m. Eastern Time for another of this series of hearings conducted by the House Government Operations Subcommittee on Employment and Housing. Earlier in the week, subcommittee members heard about the allegations of mismanagement of housing contracts from the current Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, Jack Kemp. Again, you can watch the testimony of Secretary Kemp at the subcommittee hearing. That's Sunday morning, just before 12.30 a.m. Eastern Time, which is 9.25 in the evening, for our viewers on the West Coast.